This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Appreciations and Criticisms of the Works of Charles Dickens by G. K. Chesterton Section 0 Introduction Part 1 These papers were originally published as prefaces to the separate books of Dickens in one of the most extensive of those cheap libraries of the classics, which are one of the real improvements of recent times. Thus they were harmless, being diluted by, or rather drowned in, Dickens. My scrap of theory was a mere dry biscuit to be taken with the grand tawny port of great English comedy, and by most people it was not taken at all, like the biscuit. Nevertheless, the essays were not in intention so aimless as they appear in fact. I had a general notion of what needed saying about Dickens to the new generation, though probably I did not say it. I will make another attempt to do so in this prologue, and possibly fail again. There was a painful moment, somewhere about the eighties, when we watched anxiously to see whether Dickens was fading from the modern world. We have watched a little longer, and with great relief we begin to realize that it is the modern world that is fading. All that universe of ranks and respectabilities, in comparison with which Dickens was called a caricaturist, all that Victorian universe in which he seemed vulgar, all that in itself breaking up like a cloudland. And only the caricatures of Dickens remain, like things carved in stone. This, of course, is an old story in the case of a man reproached with any excess of the poetic. Again and again, when the man of visions was pinned by the sly dog who knows the world, the man recovered of the bite, the dog it was that died. To call Thackeray a cynic, which means a sly dog, was indeed absurd, but it is fair to say that in comparison with Dickens he felt himself a man of the world. Nevertheless, that world of which he was a man is coming to an end before our eyes, its aristocracy has grown corrupt, its middle class insecure, and things that he never thought of are walking about the drawing-rooms of both. Thackeray has described forever the Anglo-Indian colonel. But what on earth would he have done with the Australian colonel? What can it matter whether Dickens' clerks talked Cockney now that half the duchesses talk American? What would Thackeray have made of an age? in which a man in the position of Lord Kew may actually be the born brother of Mr. Moss of Water Street. Nor does this apply merely to Thackeray, but to all those Victorians who prided themselves on the realism or sobriety of their descriptions. It applies to Anthony Trollope, and as much as anyone to George Eliot. For we have not only survived that present which Thackeray described, we have even survived that future to which George Eliot looked forward. It is no longer adequate to say that Dickens did not understand that old world of gentility, of parliamentary politeness, and the balance of the Constitution. That world is rapidly ceasing to understand itself. It is vain to repeat the complaint of the old quarterly reviewers that Dickens had not enjoyed a university education. What would the old quarterly reviewers themselves have thought of the Rhodes Scholarships? It is useless to repeat the old tag that Dickens could not describe a gentleman. A gentleman in our time has become something quite indescribable. Now the interesting fact is this, that Dickens, whom so many considered to be at the best a vulgar enthusiast, saw the coming change in our society much more soberly and scientifically than did his better educated and more pretentious contemporaries. I give but one example out of many. Thackeray was a good Victorian radical, who seemed to have gone to his grave quite contented with the early Victorian radical theory, the theory which Mockley preached with unparalleled luminosity and completeness. 
the theory that true progress goes on so steadily through human history that while reaction is indefensible revolution is unnecessary thackeray seems to have been quite content to think that the world would grow more and the more liberal in the limited sense that free trade would get freer that ballot boxes would grow more and more secret that at last as some satirist of liberalism puts it every man would have two votes instead of one there is no trace in thackeray of the slightest consciousness that progress could ever change its direction there is in dickens the whole of hard times is the expression of just such a realization it is not true to say that dickens was a socialist but it is not absurd to say so and it would be simply absurd to say it of any of the great individualist novelists of the victorian time dickens saw far enough ahead to know that the time was coming when the people would be imploring the state to save them from mere freedom as from some frightful foreign oppressor he felt the society changing and thackeray never did as talking about socialism and individualism is one of the greatest bores ever endured among men i will take another instance to illustrate my meaning even though the instance be queer and even a delicate one even if the reader does not agree with my deduction i ask his attention to the fact itself which i think a curiosity of literature in the last important work of dickens that excellent book our mutual friend there is an odd thing about which i cannot make up my mind i do not know whether it is unconscious observation or fiendish irony but it is this in our mutual friend is an old patriarch named aaron who is a saintly jew made to do the dirty work of an abominable christian usurer in an artistic sense i think the patriarch aaron as much of a humbug as the patriarch casby in a moral sense there is no doubt at all that dickens introduced the jew with a philanthropic idea of doing justice to judaism which he was told he had affronted by the great gargoyle of fagin if this was his motive it was morally a most worthy one but it is certainly unfortunate for the hebrew cause that the bad jew should be so very much more convincing than the good one old aaron is not an exaggeration of jewish virtues he is simply not jewish because he is not human there's nothing about him that in any way suggests the nobler sort of view such a man as spinoza or mr zangwill he is simply a public apology and like most public apologies he is very stiff and not very convincing so far so good now we come to the funny part to describe the high visionary and mystic jew like spinoza or zangwill is a great and delicate task in which even dickens might have failed but most of us know something of the make and manners of the low jew who is generally the successful one most of us know the jew who calls himself de valancourt now to anyone who knows a low jew by sight or hearing the story called our mutual friend is literally full of jews like all dickens best characters they are vivid we know them and we know them to be hebrew mr veneering the man from nowhere dark sphinx-like smiling with black curling hair and a taste in florid vulgar furniture of what stock was he mr lamley with too much nose on his face too much ginger in his whiskers too much sparkle in his studs and manners of what blood was he mr lamley's friends coarse and thick-lipped with fingers so covered with rings that they could hardly hold their gold pencils do they remind us of anybody mr fledgeby with his little ugly eyes and his social flashiness and craven bodily servility might not some fanatic like monsieur drumont make interesting conjectures about him the particular types that people hate in jewry the types that are the shame of all good jews absolutely run riot in this book which is supposed to contain an apology to them it looks at first sight as if dickens apology were one hideous sneer it looks as if he put one good jew whom nobody could believe in and then balanced him with ten bad jews whom nobody could fail to recognize 
It seems as if he had avenged himself for the doubt about Fagin by introducing five or six Fagins, triumphant Fagins, fashionable Fagins, Fagins who had changed their names. The impeccable old Aaron stands up in the middle of this ironic carnival with a peculiar solemnity and silliness. He looks like one particularly stupid Englishman pretending to be a Jew, amidst all that crowd of clever Jews who are pretending to be Englishmen. End of part one of the introduction. End of section zero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Appreciations and Criticisms of the Works of Charles Dickens by G. K. Chesterton Section 1 Introduction Part 2 But this notion of a sneer is not admissible. Dickens was far too frank and generous a writer to employ such an elaborate plot of silence. His satire was always intended to attack, never to entrap. Moreover, he was far too vain a man not to wish the crowd to see all his jokes. Vanity is more divine than pride, because it is more democratic than pride. Third, and most important, Dickens was a good liberal, and would have been horrified at the notion of making so venomous a vendetta against one race or creed. Nevertheless, the fact is there, as I say, if only as a curiosity of literature. I defy any man to read through our mutual friend, after hearing this suggestion, and to get out of his head the conviction that Lamley is the wrong kind of Jew. The explanation lies, I think, in this, that Dickens was so wonderfully sensitive to that change that has come over our society, that he noticed the type of the Oriental and cosmopolitan financier without even knowing that it was Oriental or cosmopolitan. He had, in fact, fallen a victim to a very simple fallacy affecting this problem. Somebody said, with great wit and truth, that treason cannot prosper, because when it prospers it cannot be called treason. The same argument soothed all possible anti-Semitism in men like Dickens. Jews cannot be sneaks and snobs, because when they are sneaks and snobs, they do not admit that they are Jews. I have taken this case of the growth of the cosmopolitan financier because it is not so stale in discussion as its parallel, the growth of socialism. But as regards Dickens, the same criticism applies to both. Dickens knew that socialism was coming, though he did not know its name. Similarly, Dickens knew that the South African millionaire was coming, though he did not know the millionaire's name. Nobody does. He was not a type of mind to disentangle either the abstract truths touching the socialist, nor the high personal truth about the millionaire. He was a man of impressions. He has never been equaled in the art of conveying what a man looks like at first sight, and he simply felt the two things as atmospheric facts. He felt that the mercantile power was oppressive, past all bearing by Christian men and he felt that this power was no longer wholly in the hands even of heavy English merchants like Podsnap. It was largely in the hands of a feverish and unfamiliar type like Lamley and Veneering. The fact that he felt these things is almost more impressive because he did not understand them. Now for this reason Dickens must definitely be considered in the light of the changes which his soul foresaw. Thackeray has become classical, but Dickens has done more. He has remained modern. The grand retrospective spirit of Thackeray is by its nature attached to places and times. He belongs to Queen Victoria as much as Addison belongs to Queen Anne. And it is not only Queen Anne who is dead, but Dickens, in a dark prophetic kind of way, belongs to the developments. He belongs to the times, since his death, when hard times grew harder, and when Veneering became not only a member of Parliament, 
but a cabinet minister the times when the very soul and spirit of fledgeby carried war into africa dickens can be criticized as a contemporary of bernard shaw or anatole france or c f g masterman in talking of him one need no longer talk merely of the manchester school or puseyism or the charge of the light brigade his name comes to the tongue when we are talking of christian socialists or mr roosevelt or county council steamboats or guilds of play he can be considered under new lights some larger and some meaner than his own and it is a very rough effort so to consider him which is the excuse of these pages of the essays in this book i desire to say as little as possible i will discuss any other subject in preference with a readiness which reaches to avidity but i may very curtly apply the explanation used above to the cases of two or three of them thus in the article on david copperfield i have done far less than justice to that fine book considered in its relation to eternal literature but i have dwelt at some length upon a particular element in it which has grown enormous in england after dickens death thus again in introducing sketches by bows i have felt chiefly that i am introducing them to a new generation insufficiently in sympathy with such palpable and unsophisticated fun a board school education evolved since dickens day has given to our people a queer and inadequate sort of refinement one which prevents them from enjoying the raw jests of the sketches by bows but leaves them easily open to that slight but poisonous sentimentalism which i note amid all the merits of david copperfield in the same way i shall speak of little dorrit with reference to a school of pessimistic fiction which did not exist when it was written of hard times in the light of the most modern crises of economics and of the child's history of england in the light of the most matured authority of history in short these criticisms are an intrinsically ephemeral comment from one generation upon work that will delight many more dickens was a very great man and there are many ways of testing and stating the fact but one permissible way is to say this that he was an ignorant man ill-read in the past and often confused about the present yet he remains great and true and even essentially reliable if we suppose him to have known not only all that went before his lifetime but also all that was to come after from this vanishing of the victorian compromise i might say the victorian illusion there begins to emerge a menacing and even monstrous thing we may begin again to behold the english people if that strange dawn ever comes it will be the final vindication of dickens it will be proved that he is hardly even a caricaturist that he is something very like a realist those comic monstrosities which the critics found incredible will be found to be the immense majority of the citizens of this country we shall find that sweetlepipe cuts our hair and pumblechook sells our cereals that sam weller blacks our boots and tony weller drives our omnibus for the exaggerated notion of the exaggerations of dickens as was admirably pointed out by my old friend and enemy mr blatchford in a clarion review is very largely due to our mixing with only one social class whose conventions are very strict and to whose affections we are accustomed in cabmen in cobblers in charwomen individuality is often pushed to the edge of insanity but as long as the thackerayan platform of gentility stood firm all this was comparatively speaking concealed for the english of all nations have the most uniform upper class and the most varied democracy in france it is the peasants who are solid to uniformity it is the marquises who are a little mad but in england while good form restrains and levels the universities and the army the poor people are the most motley and amusing creatures in the world full of humorous affections and prejudices and twists of irony frenchmen tend to be alike because they are all soldiers prussians because they are all something else 
probably policemen. Even Americans are all something, though it is not easy to say what it is. It goes with hawk-like eyes and in irrational eagerness. Perhaps it is savages. But two English cabmen will be as grotesquely different as Mr. Weller and Mr. Wegg. Nor is it true to say that I see this variety because it is in my own people. For I do not see the same degree of variety in my own class, or in the class above it. There is more superficial resemblance between two Kensington doctors or two Highland dukes. No, the democracy is really composed of Dickens' characters, for the simple reason that Dickens was himself one of the democracy. There remains one thing to be added to this attempt to exhibit Dickens in the growing and changing lights of our time. God forbid that anyone, especially any Dickensian, should dilute or discourage the great efforts toward social improvement. But I wish that social reformers would more often remember that they are imposing their rules not on dots and numbers, but on Bob Sawyer and Tom Lincolnwater, on Mrs. Lirriper and Dr. Marigold. I wish Mr. Sidney Webb would shut his eyes until he sees Sam Weller. A great many circumstances have led to the neglect in literature of these exuberant types, which do actually exist in the ruder classes of society. Perhaps the principal cause is that since Dickens' time, the study of the poor has ceased to be an art and become a sort of sham science. Dickens took the poor individually. All modern writing tends to take them collectively. It is said that the modern realist produces a photograph rather than a picture, but this is an inadequate objection. The real trouble with the realist is not that he produces a photograph, but that he produces a composite photograph. It is like all composite photographs, blurred, like all composite photographs, hideous, and like all composite photographs, unlike anything or anybody. The new sociological novels, which attempt to describe the abstract type of the working classes, sin in practice against the first canon of literature. True, when all others are subject to exception, literature must always be pointing out of what is interesting in life, but these books are duller than the life they represent. Even supposing that Dickens did exaggerate the greed to which one man differs from another, that was at least an exaggeration upon the side of literature. It was better than a mere attempt to reduce what is actually vivid and unmistakable to what is in comparison colorless or unnoticeable. Even the creditable and necessary efforts of our time in certain matters of social reform have discouraged the old distinctive Dickens treatment. People are so anxious to do something for the poor man that they have a sort of subconscious desire to think there is only one kind of man to do it for. Thus, while the old accounts were sometimes too steep and crazy, the new became too sweeping and flat. People write about the problem of drink, for instance, as if it were one problem. Dickens could have told them that there is the abyss between heaven and hell, between the incongruous excesses of Mr. Pickwick and the fatalistic soaking of Mr. Wickfield. He could have shown that there was nothing in common between the brandy and water of Bob Sawyer and the rum and water of Mr. Stiggins. People talk of imprudent marriages among the poor, as if it were all one question. Dickens could have told him that it is one thing to marry without much money, like Stephen Blackpool, and quite another to marry without the smallest intention of ever trying to get any, like Harold Skimpole. People talk about husbands in the working class as being kind or brutal to their wives, as if that was the one permanent problem, and no other possibility need to be considered. Dickens could have told them that there was the case, the by no means uncommon case, of the husband of Mrs. Gargery, as well as of the wife of Mr. Quillip. In short, Dickens saw the problem of the poor not as dead and definite business, but as a living and very complex one. In some ways he would be called much more conservative than the modern sociologists, in some ways much more revolutionary. End of the Introduction, Part 2 End of Section 1
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Appreciations and Criticisms of the Works of Charles Dickens by G. K. Chesterton Section 2 Introduction Part 3 Subheading Little Dorrit In the time of the decline and death of Dickens, and even more strongly after it, there arose a school of criticism which substantially maintained that a man wrote better when he was ill. It was some such sentiment as this that made Mr. George Gissing, that able writer, come near to contending that Little Dorrit is Dickens' best book. It was the principle of his philosophy to maintain, I know not why, that a man was more likely to perceive the truth when in low spirits than when in high spirits. Reprinted Pieces The three articles on Sunday of which I speak are almost the last expression of an articulate sort of English literature of the ancient and existing morality of the English people. It is always asserted that Puritanism came in with the seventeenth century and thoroughly soaked and absorbed the English. We are now, it is constantly said, an incurably Puritanic people. Personally, I have my doubts about this. I shall not refuse to admit to the Puritans that they conquered and crushed the English people, but I do not think that they ever transformed it. My doubt is chiefly derived from three historical facts. First, that England was never so richly and recognizably English as in the Shakespearean age before the Puritan had appeared. Second, that ever since he did appear, there has been a long unbroken line of brilliant and typical Englishmen who belonged to the Shakespearean and not the Puritanic tradition. Dryden, Johnson, Wilkes, Fox, Nelson were hardly Puritans. And third, that the real rise of a new cold and illiberal morality in these matters seems to me to have occurred in the time of Queen Victoria and not of Queen Elizabeth. All things considered, it is likely that future historians will say that the Puritans first really triumphed in the twentieth century and that Dickens was the last cry of Merry England. And about these additional miscellaneous and even inferior works of Dickens there is moreover another use and fascination which all Dickensians will understand, which, after a manner, is not for the profane. All who love Dickens have a strange sense that he is really inexhaustible. It is this fantastic infinity that divides him from the strongest, the healthiest romantic artists of a later day, from Stevenson, for example. I have read Treasure Island twenty times. Nevertheless, I know it but I do not really feel as if I knew all Pickwick, as I have not so much read it twenty times as read in it a million times, and it almost seemed as if I always read something new. We of the true faith look at each other and understand. Yes, our master was a magician. I believe the books are alive. I believe that leaves still grow in them as leaves grow on the trees. I believe that this fairy library flourishes and increases like a fairy forest. But the world is listening to us, and we will put our hand upon our mouth. Our Mutual Friend One thing at least seems certain. Dickens may or may not have been socialist in his tendencies. One might quote on the affirmative side his satire against Mr. Podsnap, who thought centralization un-English. One might quote in reply the fact that he satirized quite as unmercifully state and municipal officials of the most modern type. But there is one condition of affairs which Dickens would certainly have detested and denounced, and that is the condition in which we actually stand today. At this moment it is vain to discuss whether socialism will be a selling of men's liberty for bread. The men have already sold the liberty, only they have not yet got the bread. A most incessant and exacting interference with the poor is already in operation. They are already ruled like slaves, only they are not fed like slaves. The children are forcibly provided with a school, only they are not provided with a house. Officials give the most detailed domestic directions about the fire guard, only they do not give the fire guard. 
Officials bring round the most stringent directions about the milk, only they do not bring round the milk. The situation is perhaps the most humorous in the whole history of oppression. We force the black to dig, but as a concession to him we do not give him a spade. We compel him to cook, but we consult his dignity so far as to refuse him a fire. This state of things, at least, cannot conceivably endure. We must either give the workers more property and liberty, or we must feed them properly as we work them properly. If we insist on sending the menu into them, they will naturally send the bill into us. This may possibly result, it is not my purpose here to prove that it will, in the drilling of the English people into hordes of humanely herded serfs, and this again may mean the fading from our consciousness of all those elves and giant monsters and fantastics whom we are faintly beginning to feel and remember in the land. If this be so, the work of Dickens may be considered as a great vision, a vision, as Swinburne said, between a sleep and a sleep. It can be said that between the grey past of territorial depression and the grey future of economic routine, the strange clouds lifted and we beheld the land of the living. Lastly, Dickens is even astonishingly right about Eugene Rayburn. So far from approaching him with not understanding a gentleman, the critic will be astonished at the accuracy with which he has really observed the worth and weakness of the aristocrat. He is quite right when he suggests that such a man has intelligence enough to despise the invitations which he has not the energy to refuse. He is quite right when he makes Eugene, like Mr. Balfour, constantly right in argument, even when he is obviously wrong in fact. Dickens is quite right when he describes Eugene as capable of cultivating a sort of secondary and false industry about anything that is not profitable, or pursuing with passion anything that is not his business. He is quite right in making Eugene honestly appreciative of essential goodness in other people. He is quite right in making him really good at the graceful combination of satire and sentiment, both perfectly sincere. He is also right in indicating that the only cure for this intellectual condition is a violent blow on the head. David Copperfield The real achievement of the earlier part of David Copperfield lies in a certain impression of the little Copperfield living in a land of giants. It is at once gargantuan in its fancy and grossly vivid in its facts. Like Gulliver in the land of Brobdingnag, when he describes mountainous hands and faces filling the sky, bristles as big as hedges or moles as big as mole hills. To him, parents and guardians are not Olympians, as in Mr. Kenneth Graham's clever book, mysterious and dignified, dwelling upon a cloudy hill. Rather, they are all the more visible. For being large. They come out all the closer because they are colossal. Their queer features and weaknesses stand out large in a sort of gigantic domesticity, like the hairs and freckles of a Brobdingnagian. We feel the somber murdstone coming upon the house like a tall storm striding through the sky. We watch every pucker of Peggotty's pleasant face in its moods of flinty prejudice or whimsical hesitation. We look up and feel that Aunt Betsy in her garden gloves was really terrible, especially her garden gloves. But one cannot avoid the impression that as the boy grows larger, these figures grow smaller, and are not perhaps so completely satisfactory. Christmas Books And there is doubtless a certain poetic unity and irony in gathering together three or four of the crudest and most cocksure of the modern theorists with their shrill voices and metallic virtues, under the fullness and the sonorous sanity of Christian bells. But the figures satirized in the chimes cross each other's path and spoil each other in some degree. The main purpose of the book was a protest against that impudent and hard-hearted utilitarianism which arranges the people only in rows of men, or even in rows of figures. It is a flaming denunciation of that strange mathematical morality which was twisted often unfairly out of Bentham and Mill, a morality by which each citizen must regard himself as a fraction and a very vulgar fraction. Though the particular form of this insolent patronage has changed, 
this revolt and rebuke is still a value and it may be wholesome for those who are teaching the poor to be provident doubtless it is a good idea to be provident in the sense that providence is provident but that should mean being kind and certainly not being cold the cricket on the hearth though popular i think with many sections on the great army of dickensians cannot be spoken of in any such abstract or serious terms it is a brief domestic glimpse it is an interior it must be remembered that dickens was fond of interiors as such he was like a romantic tramp who should go from window to window looking in at the parlours he had that solid indescribable delight in the mere solidity and neatness of funny little humanity in its funny little houses like dolls houses to him every house was a box a christmas box in which a dancing human doll was tied up in bricks and slates instead of strings and brown paper he went from one gleaming window to another looking in at the lamp-lit parlours thus he stood for a little while looking in at this cosy if commonplace interior of the carrier and his wife but he did not stand there very long he was on his way to quainter towns and villages already the plants were sprouting upon the balcony of miss tox and the great wind was rising that flung mr pecksniff against his own front door the end of part three of the introduction end of section two This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Appreciations and Criticisms of the Works of Charles Dickens by G. K. Chesterton Section 3 Introduction Part 4 Subhead Tale of Two Cities it was well for him at any rate that the people rose in france it was well for him at any rate that the guillotine was set up in the place de la concorde unconsciously but not accidentally dickens was here working out the whole true comparison between swift revolutionism in paris and slow evolutionism in london sidney carton is one of those sublime ascetics whose head offends them and who cuts it off for him at least it was better that the blood should flow in paris than the wine should flow any longer in london and if i say that even now the guillotine might be the best cure for many a london lawyer i ask you to believe that i am not merely flippant but you will not believe it barnaby rudge it may be said that there is no comparison between that explosive opening of the intellect in paris and an antiquated madman leading a knot of provincial protestants the man of the hill says victor hugo somewhere fights for an idea the man of the forest for a prejudice nevertheless it remains true that the enemies of the red cap long attempted to represent it as a sham decoration in the style of sim tappertite long after the revolutionists had shown more than the qualities of men it was common among lords and lackeys to attribute to them the stagey and piratical pretentiousness of urchins the kings called napoleon's pistol a toy pistol even while it was holding up their coach and mastering their money or their lives they called his sword a stage sword even while they ran away from it something of the same senile inconsistency can be found in an english and an american habit common until recently that of painting the south americans at once as ruffians waiting in carnage and also as poltroons playing at war they blame them first for the cruelty of having a fight and then for the weakness of having a sham fight such however since the french revolution and before it has been the fatuous attitude of certain anglo-saxons toward the whole revolutionary tradition sim tappertite was a sort of answer to everything and the young men were mocked as prentices long after they were masters the rising fortune of the south american republics today is symbolical 
and even menacing of many things and it may be that the romance of riot will not be so much extinguished as extended and nearer home we may have boys being boys again and in london the cry of clubs the uncommercial traveller the uncommercial traveller is a collection of dickens memories rather than of his literary purposes but it is due to him to say that memory is often more startling in him than prophecy in anybody else they have the character which belongs to all his vivid incidental writing that they attach themselves always to some text which is a fact rather than an idea he was one of those sons of eve who are fonder of the tree of life than the tree of knowledge even of the knowledge of good and evil he was in this profoundest sense a realist Critics have talked of an artist with his eye on the object. Dickens, as an essayist, always had his eye on the object before he had the faintest notion of the subject. All these works of his can best be considered as letters. They are notes of personal travel, scribbles in a diary about this or that, that really happened. But Dickens was one of the few men who have the two talents that are the whole of literature, and have them both together. First, he could make a thing happen over again, and second, he could make it happen better. He can be called exaggerative, but mere exaggeration conveys nothing of his typical talent. Mere whirlwinds of words, mere melodramas of earth and heaven, do not affect us as Dickens affects us, because they are exaggerations of nothing. If asked for an exaggeration of something, their inventors would be entirely dumb. They would not know how to exaggerate a broomstick. For the life of them they could not exaggerate a ten-penny nail. Dickens always began with the nail or the broomstick. He always began with a fact. And even when he was most fanciful, and even when he drew the long bow, he was careful to hit the white. This riotous realism of Dickens has its disadvantages a disadvantage that comes out more clearly in these casual sketches than in his constructed romances. One grave defect in his greatness is that he was altogether too indifferent to theories. On large matters he went right by the very largeness of his mind, but in small matters he suffered from the lack of any logical test and ready reckoner. Hence his comment upon the details of civilization or reform are sometimes apt to be jerky and jarring, and even grossly inconsistent. So long as a thing was heroic enough to admire, Dickens admired it. Whenever it was absurd enough to laugh at, he laughed at it. So far he was on sure ground. But about all the small human projects that lie between the extremes of the sublime and the ridiculous, his criticism was apt to have an accidental quality. As Matthew Arnold said of the remarks of the young man from the country about the perambulator, they are felt not to be at the heart of the situation. On a great many occasions, the uncommercial traveller seems, like other hasty travellers, to be criticising elements and institutions which he has quite inadequately understood. And once or twice, the uncommercial traveller might almost as well be a commercial traveller, for all he knows of the countryside. An instance of what I mean may be found in the amusing article about the nightmare of the nursery. Superficially read, it might almost be taken to mean that Dickens disapproved of ghost stories, disapproved of that old and genial horror which nurses can hardly supply fast enough for the children who want it. Dickens, one would have thought, should have been the last man in the world to object to horrible stories, having himself written some of the most horrible that exist in the world. The author of The Madman's Manuscript, of The Disease of Monk and The Death of Crook, cannot be considered fastidious in the matter of revolting realism or of revolting mysticism. If artistic horror is to be kept from the young, it is at least as necessary to keep little boys from reading Pickwick or Bleak House as to refrain from telling them the story of Captain Murder or the terrible tale of Chips. If there was something appalling in the rhyme of chips and pips and ships, it was nothing compared to that infernal refrain of mudstains, bloodstains, which Dickens himself, in one of his highest moments of hellish art, 
put into Oliver Twist. I take this one instance of the excellent article called Nurse's Stories, because it is quite typical of all the rest. Dickens, accused of superficiality by those who cannot grasp that there is foam upon deep seas, was really deep about human beings. That is, he was original and creative about them. But about ideas he did tend to be a little superficial. He judged them by whether they hit him, and not by what they were trying to hit. Thus in this book the great wizard of the Christmas ghost seems almost the enemy of ghost stories. Thus the almost melodramatic moralist who created Ralph Nickleby and Jonas Chuzzlewit cannot see the point in original sin. Thus the great denouncer of official oppression in England may be found far too indulgent to the basis aspects of the modern police. His theories were less important than his creations, because he was a man of genius, but he himself thought his theories the more important, because he was a man. End of section 3. End of the introduction. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Appreciations and Criticisms of the Works of Charles Dickens by G. K. Chesterton Section 4 Chapter 2 Sketches by Bowes Part 1 the greatest mystery about almost any great writer is why he was ever allowed to write at all. The first efforts of eminent men are always imitations, and very often they are bad imitations. The only question is whether the publisher had, as his name would seem to imply, some subconscious connection or sympathy with the public, and thus felt instinctively the presence of something that might ultimately tell or whether the choice was merely a matter of chance, and one Dickens was chosen and another Dickens left. The fact is almost unquestionable. Most authors made their reputation by bad books, and afterwards supported it by good ones. This is in some degree true even in the case of Dickens. The public continued to call him Bowes long after the public had forgotten the sketches by Bowes. Numberless writers of the time speak of Bowes as having written Martin Chuzzlewit, and Bowes as having written David Copperfield. Yet if they had gone back to the original book, signed Bowes, they might even have felt that it was vulgar and flippant. This is indeed the chief tragedy of publishers, that they may easily refuse at the same moment the wrong manuscript and the right man. It is easy to see of Dickens now that he was the right man, but a man might have been very well excused if he had not realized that the sketches was the right book. Dickens, I say, is a case for this primary query, whether there was in the first work any clear sign of his higher creative spirit. But Dickens is much less a case for this query than almost all the other great men of his period. The very earliest works of Thackeray are much more unimpressive than those of Dickens. Nay, they are much more vulgar than those of Dickens. And, worst of all, they are much more numerous than those of Dickens. Thackeray came much nearer to being the ordinary literary failure than Dickens ever came. Read some of the earliest criticisms of Mr. Yellowplush or Michelangelo Titmarsh, and you will realize that at the very beginning, there was more potential clumsiness and silliness in Thackeray than there ever was in Dickens. Nevertheless, there was some potential clumsiness and silliness in Dickens, and what there is of it appears here and there in the admirable sketches by Bowes. Perhaps we may put the matter this way. This is the only one of Dickens' works of which it is ordinarily necessary to know the date. To a close and delicate comprehension it is indeed very important 
that Nicholas Nickleby was written at the beginning of Dickens' life and our mutual friend toward the end of it. Nevertheless, anybody could understand or enjoy these books whenever they were written. If our mutual friend was written in the Latin in the Dark Ages, we would still want it translated. If we thought that Nicholas Nickleby would not be written until thirty years hence, we should all wait for it eagerly. The general impression is the destruction of time. Thomas Aquinas said that there was no time in the sight of God. However this may be, there was no time in the sight of Dickens. As a general rule, Dickens can be read in any order, not only in any order of books, but even any order of chapters. In an average Dickens book, every part is so amusing and alive that you can read the parts backwards. You can read the quarrel first, and then the cause of the quarrel. You can fall in love with a woman in the tenth chapter, and then turn back to the first chapter to find out who she is. This is not chaos, it is eternity. It means merely that Dickens instinctively felt all his figures to be immortal souls, who existed, whether he wrote of them or not, and whether the reader read of them or not. There is a peculiar quality as of celestial pre-existence about the Dickens characters. Not only did they exist before we heard of them, they existed also before Dickens heard of them. As a rule, this unchangeable air in Dickens deprives any discussion about date of its point, but as I have said, this is the one of Dickens' works of which the date is essential. It is really an important part of the criticism of this book to say that it is his first book. Certain elements of clumsiness, of obviousness, of evident blunder, actually require the chronological explanation. It is biographically important that this is his first book, almost exactly in the same way that it is biographically important that the mystery of Edwin Drood was his last book. Change or no change, Edwin Drood has this plain point of a last story about it, that it is not finished. But if the last book is unfinished, the first book is more unfinished still. The sketches divide themselves, of course, into two broad classes. One half consists of sketches that are truly and in the strict sense sketches, that is, they are things that have no story in their outline, none of the character of creation. They are merely facts from the street or the tavern or the town hall, noted down as they occurred by an intelligence of quite exceptional vivacity. The second class consists of purely creative things, farces, romances, stories in any case, with a non-natural perfection, or a poetical justice, to round them off. One class is admirably represented, for instance, by the sketch describing the charity dinner, the other by such a story as that of Horatio Sparkins. These things were almost certainly written by Dickens at very different periods of his youth, and early as the harvest is, no doubt, it is a harvest he had ripened during a reasonably long time. Nevertheless, it is with these two types of narrative that the young Charles Dickens first enters English literature. He enters it with a number of journalistic notes of such things as he has seen happen in streets or offices, and with a number of short stories which err on the side of the extravagant and even the superficial. Journalism had not then indeed sunk to the low level which it has since reached. His sketches of dirty London would not have been dirty enough for the modern imperialist press. Still, these first efforts of his are journalism, and sometimes vulgar journalism. It was as a journalist that he attacked the world, as a journalist that he conquered it. The biographical circumstances will not, of course, be forgotten. The life of Dickens had been a curious one. Brought up in a family just poor enough to be painfully conscious of its prosperity and its respectability, he had been suddenly flung by a financial calamity into a social condition far below his own. For men on that exact edge of the educated class, such a transition is really tragic. A duke may become a navvy for a joke, but a clerk cannot become a navvy for a joke. Dickens' parents went to debtor's prison. Dickens himself 
went to a far more unpleasant place. The debtor's prison had about it at least that element of amiable compromise and kindly decay which belonged, and belongs still, to all the official institutions of England. But Dickens was doomed to see the very blackest aspect of the nineteenth-century England, something far blacker than any mere bad government. He went not to a prison, but to a factory. In the musty traditionalism of the Marshalsea, old John Dickens could easily remain optimistic. In the ferocious efficiency of the modern factory, young Charles Dickens narrowly escaped being a pessimist. He did escape this danger. Finally, he even escaped the factory itself. His next step in life was, if possible, even more eccentric. He was sent to school. He was sent off like an innocent little boy in Eton collars to learn the rudiments of Latin grammar without any reference to the fact that he had already taken his part in the horrible competition and actuality of the age of manufactures. It was like giving a sacked bank manager a satchel and sending him to a dame's school. Nor was the third stage of this career unconnected with the oddity of the others. On leaving the school he was made a clerk in a lawyer's office, as if henceforward this child of ridiculous changes was to settle down into a silent assistant for a quiet solicitor. It was exactly at this moment that his fundamental rebellion began to seethe. It seethed more against the quiet finality of his legal occupation than it had seethed against the squalor and slavery of his days of poverty. There must have been in his mind, I think, a dim feeling. Did all my dark crises mean only this? Was I crucified only that I might become a solicitor's clerk? Whatever be the truth about this conjecture, there can be no question about the facts themselves. It was about this time that he began to burst and bubble over, to insist upon his own intellect, to claim a career. It was about this time that he put together a loose pile of papers, satires on institutions, pictures of private persons, fairy tales of the vulgarity of his world, odds and ends such as come out of the facility and the fierce vanity of youth. It was about this time, at any rate, that he decided to publish them, and gave them the name of Sketches by Bowes. End of Section 4 Chapter 2 Part 1This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Appreciations and Criticisms of the Works of Charles Dickens by G. K. Chesterton Section 5 Chapter 2 Sketches by Bowes Part 2 they must, I think, be read in the light of this useful explosion. In some psychological sense he had really been wronged, but he had only become conscious of his wrongs as his wrongs had been gradually righted. Similarly, it has often been found that a man who can patiently endure penal servitude through a judicial blunder will nevertheless, when once his cause is well asserted, quarrel about the amount of compensation or complain of small slights in his professional existence. These are the marks of the first literary action of Dickens. It has in it all the peculiar hardness of youth, a hardness which in those who have in any way been unfairly treated reaches even to impudence. It is a terrible thing for any man to find out that his elders are wrong, and this almost unkindly courage of youth must partly be held responsible for the smartness of Dickens, that almost offensive smartness which in these earlier books of his sometimes irritates us like the showy jibes in the tall talk of a schoolboy. These first pages bear witness both to the energy of his genius and also to its unenlightenment. He seems more ignorant and more cocksure than so great a man should be. 
Dickens was never stupid, but he was sometimes silly, and he is occasionally silly here. All this must be said to prepare the more fastidious modern for these papers, if he has never read them before. But when all this has been said, there remains in them exactly what always remains in Dickens when you have taken away everything that can be taken away by the most fastidious modern who ever dissected his grandmother. There remains that primum mobile of which all the mystics have spoken, energy, the power to create. I will not call it the will to live, for that is a priggish phrase of German professors. Even German professors, I suppose, have the will to live. But Dickens had exactly what German professors have not. He had the power to live. And indeed it is most valuable to have these early specimens of the Dickens work, if only because they are specimens of his spirit apart from his matured intelligence. It is well to be able to realize that contact with the Dickens world is almost like a physical contact. It is like stepping suddenly into the hot smells of a greenhouse, or into the bleak smell of the sea. We know that we are there. Let anyone read, for instance, one of the foolish but amusing farces in the Dickens' first volume. Let him read, for instance, such a story as that of Horatio Sparkins, or that of The Tugses at Ramsgate. He will not find very much of that verbal felicity or fantastic irony that Dickens afterward developed. The incidents are upon the plain lines of the stock comedy of the day. Sharpers who entrap simpletons, spinsters who angle for husbands, youths who try to look Byronic and only look foolish. Yet there is something in these stories which there is not in the ordinary stock comedies of that day an indefinable flavor of emphasis and richness, a hint as of infinity of fun. Doubtless, for instance, a million comic writers of that epoch had made game of the dark, romantic young man who pretended to abysses of philosophy and despair. And it is not easy to say exactly why we feel that the few metaphysical remarks of Mr. Horatio Sparkins are in some way really much funnier than any of those old stock jokes. It is, in a certain quality of deep enjoyment in the writer, as well as the reader, as if the few words written had been dipped in dark nonsense and were, as it were, reeking with derision. Because if effect be the result of cause, and cause be the precursor of effect, said Mr. Horatio Sparkins, I apprehend that you are wrong. Nobody can get at the real secret of sentences like that, sentences which were afterwards strewed with reckless liberality over the conversation of Dick Swiveller, or Mr. Mantellini, Sim Tappertite, or Mr. Pecksniff. Though the joke seems almost superficial, one has only to read it a certain number of times to see that it is most subtle. The joke does not lie in Mr. Sparkins merely using long words any more than the joke lies merely in Mr. Swiveller drinking, or in Mr. Mantellini deceiving his wife. It is something in the arrangement of the words, something in the last inspired turn of absurdity given to a sentence. In spite of everything, Horatio Sparkins is funny. We cannot tell why he is funny. When we know why he is funny, we shall know why Dickens is great. Standing as we do, here upon the threshold, as it were, of the works of Dickens, it may be well perhaps to state this truth as being, after all, the most important one. This first work had, as I have said, the faults of first work and the special faults that arose from its author's accidental history. He was deprived of education and therefore was in some ways uneducated. He was confronted with the folly and failure of his natural superiors and guardians, and therefore it was in some ways pert and insolent. Nevertheless, the main fact about the work is worth stating here for any reader who should follow the chronological order and read the sketches by Boz before embarking on the stormy and splendid Sea of Pickwick. For the Sea of Pickwick, though splendid, does make some people seasick. The great point to be emphasized at such an initiation is this. 
that people, especially refined people, are not to judge of Dickens by what they would call the coarseness or commonplaceness of his subject. It is quite true that his jokes are often on the same subjects as the jokes in halfpenny comic paper, only they happen to be good jokes. He does make jokes about drunkenness, jokes about mothers-in-law, jokes about hen-pecked husbands, jokes, which is much more really unpardonable, about spinsters, jokes about physical cowardice, jokes about fatness, jokes about sitting down on one's hat. He does make fun of all these things, and the reason is not very far to seek. He makes fun of all these things, because all these things, or nearly all of them, are really very funny. But a large number of those who might otherwise read and enjoy Dickens are undoubtedly put off, as the phrase goes, by the fact that he seems to be echoing a poor kind of claptrap in his choice of incidents and images. Partly, of course, he suffers from the very fact of his success. His play with these topics was so good that everyone else has played with them increasingly since. He may indeed have copied the old jokes, but he certainly renewed them. For instance, Ali Sloper was certainly copied from Wilkins Micawber. To this day you may see, in the front page of that fine periodical, the bald head and the high shirt collar that betray the high original from which Ali Sloper is derived. But exactly because Sloper was stolen from Micawber, for that very reason, the new generation feels as if Micawber were stolen from Sloper. Many modern readers feel as if Dickens were copying the comic papers, whereas in truth the comic papers are still copying Dickens. Dickens showed himself to be an original man by always accepting old and established topics. There is no clearer sign of the absence of originality among modern poets than their disposition to find new themes. Really original poets write poems about the spring. They are always fresh, just as the spring is always fresh. Men wholly without originality write poems about torture or new religions of some perversion of obscenity, hoping the mere sting of the subject may speak for them. But we do not sufficiently realize that what is true of the classic ode is also true of the classic joke. A true poet writes about the spring being beautiful because, after a thousand springs, the spring really is beautiful. In the same way, the true humorist writes about a man sitting down on his hat because the act of sitting down on one's hat, however often and however admirably performed, really is extremely funny. We must not dismiss a new poet because his poem is called to a skylark, nor must we dismiss a humorist because his new farce is called my mother-in-law. He may really have splendid and inspiring things to say upon an eternal problem. The whole question is whether he has. Now this is exactly where Dickens, and the possible mistake about Dickens, both come in. Numbers of sensitive ladies, numbers of simple aesthetes, have had vague shrinking from that element in Dickens which begins vaguely in the Tuggses at Ramsgate and culminates in Pickwick. They have a vague shrinking from the mere subject matter from the mere fact that so much of the fun is about drinking, or fighting, or falling down, or eloping with old ladies. It is to these that the first appeal must be made upon the threshold of Dickens' criticism. Let them really read the thing, and really see whether the humor is the gross and half-witted jeering which they imagine it to be. It is exactly here that the whole genius of Dickens is concerned. His subjects are indeed stock subjects, like the Skylark of Shelley or the Autumn of Keats. But all the more, because they are stock subjects, the reader realizes what a magician is at work. The notion of a clumsy fellow who falls off his horse is indeed a stock and stale subject. But Mr. Winkle is not a stock and stale subject. 
nor is his horse a stock and stale subject. It is as immortal as the horses of Achilles. The notion of a fat old gentleman, proud of his legs, might easily be vulgar, but Mr. Pickwick, proud of his legs, is not vulgar. Somehow, we feel, they were legs to be proud of. And it is exactly this that we must look for in these sketches. We must not leap to any cheap fancy that they are low farces. Rather, we must see that they are not low farces, and see that nobody but Dickens could have prevented them from being so. The end of chapter 2, end of section 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Appreciations and Criticisms of the Works of Charles Dickens by G. K. Chesterton. Section 6. Chapter 3. Pickwick Papers. Part 1. There are those who deny with enthusiasm the existence of God, and are happy in a hobby which they call the mistakes of Moses. I have not studied their labors in detail, but it seems the chief mistake of Moses was that he neglected to write the Pentateuch. The lesser errors apparently were not made by Moses, but by another person equally unknown. These controversialists cover the very widest field and their attacks upon the scripture are very to the point of wildness. They range from the proposition that the unexpurgated Bible is almost as unfit for American girl school as is an unexpurgated Shakespeare. They descend to the proposition that kissing the book is almost as hygienically dangerous as kissing the babies of the poor. A superficial critic might well imagine that there was not one single sentence left of the Hebrew or Christian scripture which this school had not marked with some ingenious and uneducated comment. But there is one passage, at least, upon which they have never pounced, at least to my knowledge, and in pointing it out to them, I feel I am, or ought to be, providing material for quite a multitude of Hyde Park orations. I mean that singular arrangement in the mystical account of the creation, by which light is created first, and all the luminous bodies afterward. One could not imagine a process more open to the elephantine logic of the Bible smasher than this, that the sun should be created after the sunlight. The conception that lies at the back of the phrase is indeed profoundly antagonistic to much of the modern point of view. To many modern people it would sound like saying that foliage existed before the first leaf. It would sound like saying that childhood existed before a baby was born. The idea is, as I have said, alien to most modern thought, and like many other ideas which are alien to most modern thought, it is a very subtle and a very sound idea. Whatever be the meaning of the passage in the actual primeval poem, there is a very real metaphysical meaning in the idea that light existed before the sun and stars. It is not barbaric, it is rather platonic. The idea existed before any of the machinery which made manifest the idea. Justice existed when there was no need of judges, and mercy existed before any man was oppressed. However this may be in the matter of religion and philosophy, it can be said with little exaggeration that this truth is the very key of literature. The whole difference between construction and creation is exactly this that a thing constructed can only be loved after it is constructed, but a thing created is loved before it exists, as the mother can love the unborn child. In creative art, the essence of a book exists before the book, or even the details or main features of the book. The author enjoys it and lives in it with a kind of prophetic rapture. He wishes to write a comic story before he has thought of a single comic incident, he desires to write a sad story before he has thought of anything sad. 
He knows atmosphere before he knows anything. There is a low, priggish maxim, sometimes uttered by men so frivolous as to take humour seriously, a maxim that a man should not laugh at his own jokes. But the great artist not only laughs at his own jokes, he laughs at his own jokes before he has even made them. In the case of a man really humorous, we can see humour in his eye before he has thought of any amusing words at all. So the creative writer laughs at his comedy before he creates it, and he has tears for his tragedy before he knows what it is. When the symbols and the fulfilling facts do come to him, they come generally in a manner very fragmentary and inverted, almost in irrational glimpses of crises or consummation. The last page comes before the first. Before his romance has begun, he knows it has ended well. He sees the wedding before the wooing. He sees the death before the duel. But most of all, he sees the color and character of the whole story prior to any possible events in it. This is the real argument for art and style, only that the artists and the stylists have not the sense to use it. In one very real sense, style is far more important than either character or narrative, for a man knows what style of book he wants to write when he knows nothing else about it. Pickwick is, in Dickens' career, the mere mass of light before the creation of sun or moon. It is the splendid, shapeless substance of which all his stars were ultimately made. You might split up Pickwick into innumerable novels, as you could split up that primeval light into innumerable solar systems. The Pickwick papers constitute first and foremost a kind of wild promise, a prenatal vision of all the children of Dickens. He had not yet settled down into the plain professional habit of picking out a plot and characters, of attending to one thing at a time, writing a separate sensible novel and sending it off to his publishers. He is still in the youthful world of the kind of world that he would like to create. He has not yet really settled down what story he will write, but only what sort of story he will write. He tries to tell ten stories all at once. He pours into the pot all the chaotic fancies and crude experiences of his boyhood. He sticks in irrelevant short stories shamelessly as into a scrapbook. He adopts designs and abandons them, begins episodes, and leaves them unfinished. But from the first page to the last there is a nameless and elemental ecstasy, that of the man who is doing the kind of thing he can do. Dickens, like every other honest and effective writer, came at last to some degree of care and self-restraint. He learned how to make his dramatist persona assist his drama. He learned how to write stories which were full of rambling and perversity, but which were stories. But before he wrote a single real story, he had a kind of vision. It was a vision of the Dickens world, a maze of white roads, a map full of fantastic towns, thundering coaches, clamorous market-places, uproarious inns, strange and swaggering figures. That vision was Pickwick. It must be remembered that this is true, even in connection with the man's contemporaneous biography. Apart from anything else about it, Pickwick was his first great chance. It was a big commission given in some sense to an untried man, that he might show what he could do. It was in a strict sense a sample, and just as a sample of leather can only be a piece of leather, or a sample of coal, a lump of coal, so this book may most properly be regarded as simply a lump of Dickens. He was anxious to show all that was in him. He was more concerned to prove that he could write well than to prove they could write this particular book well. And he did prove this, at any rate. No one ever sent such a sample as the sample of Dickens. His roll of leather blocked up the street, his lump of coal set the Thames on fire. The book originated in the suggestion of a publisher, as many more good books have done than the arrogance of the man of letters is commonly inclined to admit. Very much is said in our time about Apollo and Admetus, and the impossibility of asking genius to work within prescribed limits 
or assist an alien design. But after all, as a matter of fact, some of the greatest geniuses have done it, from Shakespeare botching up bad comedies and dramatizing bad novels, down to Dickens writing a masterpiece as the mere framework for Mr. Seymour's sketches. Nor is the true explanation irrelevant to the spirit and power of Dickens. Very delicate, slender, and bizarre talents are indeed incapable of being used for an outside purpose, whether of public good or of private gain. But about very great and rich talent there goes a certain disdainful generosity which can turn its hand to anything. Minor poets cannot write to order, but very great poets can write to order. The larger the man's mind, the wider his scope of vision, the more likely it will be that anything suggested to him will seem significant and promising. The more he has a grasp of everything, the more ready he will be to write anything. It is very hard, if that is the question, to throw a brick at a man and ask him to write an epic. But the more he is a great man, the more able he will be to write about the brick. It is very unjust, if that is all, to point out to the hoarding of Coleman's mustard and demand a flood of philosophical eloquence. But the greater the man is, the more likely he will be to give it to you. So it was proved, not for the first time, in this great experiment of the early employment of Dickens. Messrs. Chapman and Hall came to him with a scheme for a string of sporting stories to serve as the context, and one might almost say the excuse for a string of sketches by Seymour, the sporting artist. Dickens made some modifications in the plan, but he adopted its main feature, and its main feature was Mr. Winkle. To think of what Mr. Winkle might have been in the hands of a dull farseer, and then to think of what he is, is to experience the feeling that Dickens made a man out of rags and refuse. Dickens was to work splendidly and successfully in many fields and to send forth many brilliant books and brave figures. He was destined to have the applause of continents like a statesman, and to dictate to his publishers like a despot. But perhaps he never worked again so supremely well as here, where he worked in chains. It may well be questioned whether his one hack book is not his masterpiece. End of section 6, chapter 3 Part 1。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Appreciations and Criticisms of the Works of Charles Dickens by G. K. Chesterton. Section 7, Chapter 3, Pickwick Papers, Part 2 Of course it is true that as he went on his independence increased, and he kicked quite free of the influence that had suggested his story. So Shakespeare declared his independence of the original chronicle of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, eliminating altogether, with some wisdom, another uncle called Wiglerus. At the start, the Nimrod Club of Chapman and Hall may have even had equal chances with the Pickwick Club of young Mr. Dickens. But the Pickwick Club became something much better than any publisher had dared to dream of. Some of the old links were indeed severed by accident or extraneous trouble. Seymour, for whose sake the whole had perhaps been planned, blew his brains out before he had drawn ten pictures. But such things were trifles compared to Pickwick itself. It mattered little now whether Seymour blew his brains out, so long as Charles Dickens blew his brains in. The work became systematically and progressively more powerful and masterly. Many critics have commented on the somewhat discordant and inartistic change between the earlier part of Pickwick and the later. They have pointed out, not without good sense, that the character of Mr. Pickwick changes from that of a silly buffoon to that of a solid merchant. But the case, if these critics had noticed it, is much stronger in the minor characters of the great company. Mr. Winkle, 
who has been an idiot, even, perhaps as Mr. Pickwick says, an impostor, suddenly becomes a romantic and even a reckless lover, scaling a forbidden wall and planning a bold elopement. Mr. Snodgrass, who has behaved in ridiculous manner in all serious positions, suddenly finds himself in a ridiculous position, that of a gentleman surprised in a secret love affair, and behaves in a manner perfectly manly, serious, and honorable. Mr. Tupman alone has no serious emotional development, and for this reason it is, presumably, that we hear less and less of Mr. Tupman toward the end of the book. Dickens has by this time got into a thoroughly serious mood, a mood expressed indeed by extravagant incidents, but none the less serious for that, and into this Winkle and Snodgrass, in the character of romantic lovers, could be made to fit. Mr. Tupman had to be left out of the love affairs, therefore Mr. Tupman is left out of the book. Much of the change was due to the entrance of the greatest character in the story. It may seem strange at the first glance to say that Sam Weller helped to make the story serious. Nevertheless, this is strictly true. The introduction of Sam Weller had to begin with some merely accidental and superficial effects. When Sam Weller had appeared, Samuel Pickwick was no longer the chief farcical character. Weller became the joker, and Pickwick, in some sense, the butt of his jokes. Thus it was obvious that the more simple, solemn, and really respectable this butt could be made, the better. Mr. Pickwick had been the figure, capering before the footlights, but with the advent of Sam, Mr. Pickwick had become a sort of black background, and had to behave as such. But this explanation, though true as far as it goes, is a mean and unsatisfactory one, leaving the great elements unexplained. For a much deeper and more righteous reason, Sam Weller introduces the more serious tone of Pickwick. He introduces it because he introduces something which it was the chief business of Dickens to preach throughout his life, something which he never preached so well as when he preached it unconsciously. Sam Weller introduces the English people. Sam Weller is the great symbol in English literature of the populace peculiar to England. His incessant stream of sane nonsense is a wonderful achievement of Dickens. It is no great falsification of the incessant stream of sane nonsense as it really exists among the English poor. The English poor live in an atmosphere of humor. They think in humor. Irony is the very air that they breathe. A joke comes suddenly from time to time into the head of a politician or a gentleman, and then as a rule he makes the most of it. But when a serious word comes into the mind of a coster, it is almost as startling as a joke. The word chaff was, I suppose, originally applied to badinage to express its barren and unsustaining character. But to the English poor, chaff is as sustaining as grain. The phrase that leaps to their lips is the ironical phrase. I remember once being driven in a handsome cab down a street that turned out to be a cul-de-sac, and brought us bang up against a wall. The driver and I simultaneously said something. But I said, this'll never do, and he said, this is all right. Even in the act of pulling back his horse's nose from a brick wall that confirms satirist thought in terms of his highly trained and traditional satire, while I, belonging to a duller and simpler class, expressed my feelings in words as innocent and literal as those of a rustic or a child. This eternal output of divine derision has never been so truly typified as by the character of Sam. He is a grotesque fountain which gushes the living waters for ever. Dickens is accused of exaggeration, and he is often guilty of exaggeration. But here he does not exaggerate. He merely symbolizes and sublimates like any other great artist. Sam Weller does not exaggerate the wit of the London Street Arab one atom more than Colonel Newcomb, let us say, exaggerates the stateliness of an ordinary soldier and gentleman or then Mr. Collins exaggerates the fatuity of a certain kind of country clergyman. And this breath from the boisterous brotherhood of the poor 
lent a special seriousness and smell of reality to the whole story. The unconscious follies of Winkle and Tupman are blown away like leaves before the solid and conscious folly of Sam Weller. Moreover, the relations between Pickwick and his servant Sam are in some ways new and valuable in literature. Many comic writers had described the clever rascal and his ridiculous dupe, but here, in a fresh and very human atmosphere, we have a clever servant who was not a rascal and a dupe, who was not ridiculous. Sam Weller stands in some ways for a cheerful knowledge of the world. Mr. Pickwick stands for a still more cheerful ignorance of the world, and Dickens responded to a profound human sentiment, the sentiment that has made saints and the sanctity of children, when he made the gentler and less travelled type, the type which moderates and controls. Knowledge and innocence are both excellent things and they are both very funny. But it is right that knowledge should be the servant, and innocence the master. The sincerity of this study of Sam Weller has produced one particular effect in the book, which I wonder that critics of Dickens have never noticed or discussed. Because it has no Dickens pathos, certain parts of it are truly pathetic. Dickens, realizing rightly that the whole tone of the book was fun, felt that he ought to keep out of it any great experiments in sadness, and keep within limits those that he put in. He used this restraint in order not to spoil the humour, but, if he had known himself better, he might well have used it in order not to spoil the pathos. This is the one book in which Dickens was, as it were, forced to trample down his tender feelings, and for that very reason it is the one book where all the tenderness there is, is quite unquestionably true. An admirable example of what I mean may be found in the scene in which Sam Weller goes down to see his bereaved father after the death of his stepmother. The most loyal admirer of Dickens can hardly prevent himself from giving a slight shudder when he thinks of what Dickens might have made of that scene in some of his more expansive and maudlin moments. For all I know, old Mrs. Weller might have asked what the wild waves were saying, and for all I know, old Mr. Weller might have told her. As it is, Dickens, being forced to keep the tale taut and humorous, gives a picture of humble respect and decency which is manly, dignified, and really sad. There is no attempt made by these simple and honest men, the father and son, to pretend that the dead woman was anything greatly other than she was. Their respect is for death and for the human weakness and mystery which it must finally cover. Old Tony Weller does not tell his shrewish wife that she is already a white-winged angel. He speaks to her with an admirable good nature and good sense. Susan, I says, you've been a very good wife to me altogether. Keep a good heart, my dear, and you'll live to see me punch that ear Stiggins head yet. She smiled at this, Samville, but she died at her all. That is perhaps the first and last time that Dickens ever touched the extreme dignity of pathos. He is restraining his compassion, and afterwards he let it go. Now laughter is a thing that can be let go. Laughter has in it a quality of liberty. But sorrow has in it, by its very nature, a quality of confinement. Pathos, by its very nature, fights with itself. Humor is expansive. It bursts outward. The fact is attested by the common expression, holding one's sides. But sorrow is not expansive, and it was afterwards the mistake of Dickens that he tried to make it expansive. It is the one great weakness of Dickens as a great writer, that he did try to make that sudden sadness, that abrupt pity which we call pathos, a thing quite obvious, infectious, public, as if it were journalism or the measles. It is pleasant to think that in this supreme masterpiece, done in the dawn of his career, there is not even this faint fleck upon the sun of his just splendor. Pickwick will always be remembered, as the great example of everything that made Dickens great, of the solemn conviviality of great friendships, of the erratic adventures of old English roads, 
of the hospitality of old English inns, of the great fundamental kindliness and honour of old English manners. First of all, however, it will always be remembered for its laughter, or if you will, for its folly. A good joke is the one ultimate and sacred thing which cannot be criticised. Our relations with a good joke are direct and even divine relations. We speak of seeing a joke just as we speak of seeing a ghost or vision. If we have seen it, it is futile to argue with us, and if we have seen the vision of Pickwick, Pickwick may be the top of Dickens' humour, I think upon the whole of it is, but the broad humour of Pickwick he broadened over many wonderful kingdoms, the narrow pathos of Pickwick he never found again. End of section 7 End of Pickwick Papers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Appreciations and Criticisms of the Work of Charles Dickens by G. K. Chesterton Section 8, Chapter 4, Nicholas Nickleby, Part 1 Romance is, perhaps, the highest point of human expression, except indeed religion, to which it is closely allied. Romance resembles religion especially in this, that it is not only a simplification but a shortening of existence. Both romance and religion see everything as it were foreshortened. They see everything in an abrupt and fantastic perspective, coming to an apex. It is the whole essence of perspective that it comes to a point. Similarly, religion comes to a point, to the point. Thus religion is always insisting on the shortness of human life, but it does not insist on the shortness of human life as the pessimists insist on it. Pessimism insists on the shortness of human life in order to show that life is valueless. Religion insists on the shortness of human life in order to show that life is frightfully valuable, is almost horribly valuable. Pessimism says that life is so short that it gives nobody a chance. Religion says that life is so short that it gives everybody his final chance. In the first case, the word brevity means futility. In the second case, opportunity. But the case is even stronger than this. Religion shortens everything. Religion shortens even eternity, where science, submitting to the false standard of time, sees evolution which is slow, religion sees creation which is sudden. Philosophically speaking, the process is neither slow nor quick, since we have nothing to compare it with. Religion prefers to think of it as quick. For religion, the flowers shoot up suddenly, like rockets. For religion, the mountains are lifted up suddenly, like waves. Those who quote that fine passage which says that in God's sight a thousand years are as yesterday, that is, past, as a watch in the night, do not realize the full force of the meaning. To God a thousand years are not only a watch, but an exciting watch. For God, time goes at a gallop, as it does to a man reading a good tale. All this is, in a humble manner, true for romance. Romance is a shortening and sharpening of the human difficulty, where you and I have to vote against a man, or write rather feebly against a man, or sign illegible petitions against a man. Romance does for him what we should really like to see done. It knocks him down. It shortens the slow process of historical justice. All romances consist of three characters. Other characters may be introduced, but those other characters are certainly merely scenery as far as the romance is concerned. They are bushes that wave rather excitedly. They are posts that stand up with a certain pride. They are correctly painted rocks that frown very correctly. But they are all 
landscape. They are all a background. In every pure romance there are three living and moving characters. For the sake of argument they may be called St. George and the Dragon and the Princess. In every romance there must be the twin elements of loving and fighting. In every romance there must be the three characters. There must be the princess, who is a thing to be loved. There must be the dragon, who is a thing to be fought. And there must be St. George, who is a thing that both loves and fights. There have been many symptoms of cynicism and decay in our modern civilization. But of all the signs of modern feebleness, of lack of grasp on morals, as they actually must be, there has been none quite so silly or so dangerous as this, that the philosophers of today have started to divide loving from fighting and to put them into opposite camps. There could be no worse sign than that a man, even Nietzsche, can be found to say that we should go in for fighting instead of loving. There can be no worse sign that a man, even Tolstoy, can be found to tell us that we should go in for loving instead of fighting. The two things imply each other. They implied each other in the old romance and in the old religion, which were the two permanent things of humanity. You cannot love a thing without wanting to fight for it. You cannot fight without something to fight for. To love a thing without wishing to fight for it is not to love it at all. It is lust. It may be an airy, philosophical, and disinterested lust. It may be, so to speak, a virgin lust. But it is lust, because it is wholly self-indulgent and invites no attack. On the other hand, fighting for a thing without loving it is not even fighting. It can only be called a kind of horseplay that is occasionally fatal. Wherever human nature is human and unspoilt by any special sophistry, there exists this natural kinship between war and wooing, and that natural kinship is called romance. It comes upon a man, especially in the great hour of youth, and every man who has ever been young at all has felt, if only for a moment, this ultimate and poetic paradox. He knows that loving the world is the same thing as fighting the world. It was at the very moment when he offered to like everybody, he also offered to hit everybody. To almost every man that can be called a man, this especial moment of the romantic culmination has come. In the first resort, the man wished to live a romance. In the second resort, in the last and worst resort, he was content to write one. Now there is a certain moment when this element enters independently into the life of Dickens. There is a particular time when we can see him suddenly realize that he wants to write a romance and nothing else. In reading his letters and appreciating his character, this point emerges clearly enough. He was full of the afterglow of his marriage. He was still young and psychologically ignorant. Above all, he was now really, for the first time, sure that he was going to be at least some kind of success. There is, I repeat, a certain point at which one feels that Dickens will either begin to write romances or go off on something different altogether. This crucial point in his life is marked by Nicholas Nickleby. It must be remembered that before this issue of Nicholas Nickleby, his work, successful as it was, had not been such as to dedicate him seriously or irrevocably to the writing of novels. He had already written three books, and at least two of them are classed among the novels under his name. But if we look at the actual origin and formation of these books, we see that they came from another source and were really designed upon another plan. The three books were, of course, The Sketches by Bowes, The Pickwick Papers, and Oliver Twist. It is, I suppose, sufficiently well understood that the sketches by Bowes are, as their name implies, only sketches. But surely it is quite equally clear that the Pickwick papers are, as their name implies, merely papers. 
Nor is the case at all different in spirit and essence when we come to Oliver Twist. There is indeed a sort of romance in Oliver Twist, but it is such an uncommonly bad one that it can hardly be regarded as greatly interrupting the previous process. And if the reader chooses to pay very little attention to it, he cannot pay less attention to it than the author did. But in fact the case lies far deeper. Oliver Twist is so much apart from the ordinary track of Dickens, it is so gloomy, it is so much all in one atmosphere, that it can best be considered as an exception or a solitary excursus in his work. Perhaps it can best be considered as the extension of one of his old sketches, of some sketch that happened to be about a visit to a workhouse or a goal. In the sketches by Bowes, he might well have visited a workhouse where he saw Bumble. In the sketches by Bowes, he might well have visited a prison where he saw Fagin. We are still in the realm of sketches and sketchiness. The Pickwick Papers may be called an extension of one of his bright sketches. Oliver Twist may be called an extension of one of his gloomy ones. Had he continued along this line, all his books might very well have been notebooks. It would be very easy to split up all his subsequent books into scraps and episodes, such as those which make up the sketches by Bowes. It would be easy enough for Dickens, instead of publishing Nicholas Nickleby, to have published a book of sketches, one of which was called A Yorkshire School, another called A Provincial Theatre, and another called Sir Mulberry Hawk, or High Life Revealed, another called Mrs. Nickleby, or A Lady's Monologue. It would have been very easy to have thrown over the rather chaotic plan of the old curiosity shop. He might have merely written short stories called The Glorious Apollos, Mrs. Quillip's Tea Party, Mrs. Jarley's Waxwork, The Little Servant, and The Death of a Dwarf. Martin Chuzzlewit might have been twenty stories instead of one story. Dombry and Son might have been twenty stories instead of one story. We might have lost all Dickens' novels. We might have lost altogether Dickens the novelist. We might have lost that steady love of a seminal and growing romance which grew on him steadily as the years advanced, and which gave us toward the end some of his greatest triumphs. All his books might have been sketches by bows, but he did turn away from this, and the turning point is Nicholas Nickleby. End of section 8 Nicholas Nickleby, Part 1This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Appreciations and Criticisms of the Works of Charles Dickens by G. K. Chesterton Section 9, Chapter 4, Nicholas Nickleby, Part 2 Everything has a supreme moment and is crucial. That is where our friends, the evolutionists, go wrong. I suppose that there is an instant of midsummer as there is an instant of midnight. If in the same way there is a supreme point of spring, Nicholas Nickleby is the supreme point of Dickens' spring. I do not mean that it is the best book that he wrote in his youth. Pickwick is a better book. I do not mean that it contains more striking characters than any of the other books in his youth. The Old Curiosity Shop contains at least two more striking characters. But I mean that this book coincided with his resolution to be a great novelist, and his final belief that he could be one. Henceforward his books are novels, very commonly bad novels. Previously they have not really been novels at all. There are many indications of the change I mean. Here is one, for instance, which is more or less final. Nicholas Nickleby is Dickens' first romantic novel, because it is his first novel with a proper and dignified romantic hero, which means, of course, a somewhat chivalrous young donkey. The hero of Pickwick is an old man. The hero of Oliver Twist is a child. Even after Nicholas Nickleby, 
this non-romantic custom continued. The old curiosity shop has no hero in particular. The hero of Barnaby Rudge is a lunatic. But Nicholas Nickleby is a proper, formal, and ceremonial hero. He has no psychology, he has not even any particular character, but he is made deliberately a hero, young, poor, brave, unimpeachable, and ultimately triumphant. He is, in short, the hero. Mr. Vincent Crumless had a colossal intellect, and I always have had a fancy that under all his pomposity he saw things more keenly than he allowed others to see. The moment he saw Nicholas Nickleby, almost in rags and limping along the high road, he engaged him, you will remember, as first walking gentleman. He was right. Nobody could possibly be more of a first walking gentleman than Nicholas Nickleby was. He was the first walking gentleman before he went on to the boards of Mr. Vincent Crumless Theatre, and he remained the first walking gentleman after he had come off. Now this romantic method involves a certain element of climax, which to us appears crudity. Nicholas Nickleby, for instance, wanders through the world. He takes a situation as assistant to a Yorkshire schoolmaster. He sees an act of tyranny, of which he strongly disapproves. He cries out, Stop! in a voice that makes the rafters ring. He thrashes the old schoolmaster within an inch of his life. He throws the schoolmaster away like an old cigar, and he goes away. The modern intellect is positively prostrated and flattened by this rapid and romantic way of righting wrongs. If a modern philanthropist came to Dothboys Hall, I fear he would not employ the simple, sacred, and truly Christian solution of beating Mr. Squeers with a stick. I fancy he would petition the government to appoint a royal commission to inquire into Mr. Squeers. I think he would every now and then write letters to newspapers reminding people that, in spite of all appearances to the contrary, there was a royal commission to inquire into Mr. Squeers. I agree that he might even go the length of calling a crowd meeting at St. James Hall on the subject of his best policy with regard to Mr. Squeers. At this meeting some very heated and daring speaker might even go the length of alluding sternly to Mr. Squeers. Occasionally, even hoarse voices from the back of the hall might ask in vain what was going to be done with Mr. Squeers. The Royal Commission would report about three years afterwards, and would say that many things had happened which were certainly most regrettable, that Mr. Squeers was the victim of a bad system, that Mrs. Squeers was also the victim of a bad system, but that the man who sold Squeers his cane had really acted with great indiscretion, and ought to be spoken to kindly. Something like this would be what, after four years, the Royal Commission would have said. But it would not matter in the least what the Royal Commission had said, for by that time the philanthropists would have been off on a new tack, and the world would have forgotten all about Dothboys Hall, and everything connected with it. By that time the philanthropists would be petitioning Parliament for another Royal Commission, perhaps a Royal Commission to inquire into whether Mr. Mantellini was extravagant with his wife's money perhaps a commission to inquire into whether Mr. Vincent Crumless kept the infant phenomenon short by means of gin. If we wish to understand the spirit and period of Nicholas Nickleby, we must endeavor to comprehend and to appreciate the old, more decisive remedies, or if we prefer to put it so, the old, more desperate remedies. Our fathers had a plain sort of pity, if you will, a gross and coarse pity, they had their own sort of sentimentalism. They were quite willing to weep over Smike, but it certainly never occurred to them to weep over Squeers. Even those who opposed the French war opposed it exactly in the same way as their enemies opposed the French soldiers. They fought with fighting. Charles Fox was full of horror at the bitterness and useless bloodshed, but if anyone had insulted him over the matter, he would have gone out and shot him in a duel, as coolly as any of his contemporaries. All their interference was heroic interference. All their legislation was heroic legislation. All their remedies were heroic remedies. 
No doubt they were often narrow and often visionary. No doubt they often looked at a political formula when they should have looked at an elemental fact. No doubt they were pedantic in some of their principles and clumsy in some of their solutions. No doubt, in short, they were all very wrong, and no doubt we are the people, and wisdom shall die with us. But when they saw something which, in their eyes, such as they were, really violated their morality, such as it was, then they did not cry investigate, they did not cry educate, they did not cry improve, they did not cry evolve. Like Nicholas Nickleby, they cried stop, and it did stop. This is the first mark of the purely romantic method, the swiftness and simplicity with which St. George kills the dragon. The second mark of it is exhibited here as one of the weaknesses of Nicholas Nickleby. I mean the tendency in the purely romantic story to regard the heroine merely as something to be won, to regard the princess solely as something to be saved from the dragon. The father of Madeline Bray is really a very respectable dragon, his selfishness is suggested with much more psychological tact and truth than that of any other of the villains that Dickens described about this time. But his daughter is merely the young woman with whom Nicholas is in love. We do not care a rap about Madeline Bray. Personally, I should have preferred Cecilia Bobster. Here is one real point where the Victorian romance falls below the Elizabethan romantic drama. Shakespeare always made his heroines heroic as well as his heroes. In Dickens' actual literary career, it is this romantic quality in Nicholas Nickleby that is most important. It is his first definite attempt to write a young and chivalrous novel. In this sense, the comic characters and the comic scenes are secondary. And indeed, the comic characters and the comic scenes, admirable as they are, could never be considered as in themselves superior to such characters and such scenes in many of the other books. But in themselves, how unforgettable they are. Mr. Crumless and the whole of his theatrical business is an admirable case of that first and most splendid quality in Dickens. I mean the art of making something which in life we call pompous and dull, becoming in literature pompous and delightful. I have remarked before that nearly every one of the amusing characters of Dickens is in reality a great fool. But I might go further. Almost every one of his amusing characters is in reality a great bore. The very people that we fly to in Dickens are the very people that we fly from in life. And there is more in Crumless than in the mere entertainment of his solemnity and his tedium. The enormous seriousness with which he takes his art is always an exact touch in regard to the unsuccessful artist. If an artist is successful, everything then depends upon a dilemma of his moral character. If he is a mean artist, success will make him a society man. If he is a magnanimous artist, success will make him an ordinary man. But only as long as he is unsuccessful, he will be an unfathomable and serious artist like Mr. Crumless. Dickens was always particularly good at expressing thus the treasures that belong to those who do not succeed in this world. There are vast prospects and splendid songs in the point of view of the typically unsuccessful man. If all the used-up actors and spoiled journalists and broken clerks could give a chorus, it would be a wonderful chorus in praise of the world. But these unsuccessful men commonly cannot even speak. Dickens is the voice of them, and a very ringing voice, because he was perhaps the only one of these unsuccessful men that was ever successful. End of section 9 End of chapter 4 Nicholas Nickleby This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Appreciations and Criticisms of the Works of Charles Dickens by G. K. Chesterton Section 10 Chapter 5 Oliver Twist In considering Dickens, as we almost always must consider him, as a man of rich originality, we may possibly miss the forces from which he drew even his original energy. It is not well for man to be alone. We in the modern world are ready enough to admit that when it is applied to some problem of monasticism or of an ecstatic life. But we will not admit that our modern artistic claim to absolute originality is really a claim to absolute unsociability, a claim to absolute loneliness. The anarchist is at least as solitary as the ascetic, and the men of very vivid vigor in literature, the men such as Dickens, have generally displayed a large sociability towards the society of letters, always expressed in the happy pursuit of pre-existent themes, sometimes expressed, as in the case of Moliere or Stern, in downright plagiarism. For even theft is a confession of our dependence on society. In Dickens, however, this element of the original foundations on which he worked is quite especially difficult to determine. This is partly due to the fact that for the present reading public he is practically the only one of his long line that is read at all. He sums up Smollett and Goldsmith, but he also destroys them. This one giant, being closest to us, cuts off from our view even the giants that begat him. But much more is this difficulty due to the fact that Dickens mixed up with the old material, materials so subtly modern, so made of the French Revolution, that the whole is transformed. If we want the best example of this, the best example is Oliver Twist. Relatively to the other works of Dickens, Oliver Twist is not of great value, but it is of great importance. Some parts of it are so crude and of so clumsy a melodrama that one is almost tempted to say that Dickens would have been greater without it. But even if he had been greater without it, he would still have been incomplete without it. With the exception of some gorgeous passages, both of humor and horror, the interest of the book lies not so much in its revelation of Dickens' literary genius as in its revelation of those moral, personal, and political instincts which were the make-up of his character and the permanent support of that literary genius. It is by far the most depressing of all his books. It is in some ways the most irritating. Yet its ugliness gives the last touch of honesty to all that spontaneous and splendid output. Without this one discordant note, all his merriment might have seemed like levity. Dickens had just appeared upon the stage and set the whole world laughing with his first great story, Pickwick. Oliver Twist was his encore. It was the second opportunity given to him by those who had rolled about with laughter over Tupman and Jingle, Weller and Dowler. Under such circumstances, a stagey reciter will sometimes take care to give a pathetic piece after his humorous one, and with all his many moral merits, there was much that was stagey about Dickens. But this explanation alone is altogether inadequate and unworthy. There was in Dickens this other kind of energy, horrible, uncanny, barbaric, capable in another age of coarseness, greedy for the emblems of established ugliness, the coffin, the gibbet, the bones, the bloody knife. Dickens liked these things, and he was all the more of a man for liking them, especially he was all the more of a boy. We can all recall with pleasure the fact that Miss Petoker, afterwards Mrs. Lillivick, was in the habit of reciting a poem called The Blood Drinker's Burial. I cannot express my regret that the words of this poem are not given, for Dickens would have been quite as capable of writing The Blood Drinker's Burial as Mrs. Petoker was of reciting it. This strain existed in Dickens alongside of his happy laughter. Both were allied to the same robust romance. Here, as elsewhere, Dickens is close to all the permanent human things. 
he is close to religion which he has never allowed the thousand devils on its churches to stop the dancing of its bells he is allied to the people to the real poor who love nothing so much as to take a cheerful glass and to talk about funerals the extremes of his gloom and gaiety are the mark of religion and democracy they mark him off from the moderate happiness of philosophers and from that stoicism which is the virtue and the creed of aristocrats there is nothing odd in the fact that the same man who conceived the humane hospitalities of pickwick should also have imagined the inhuman laughter of fagin's den they are both genuine and they are both exaggerated and the whole human tradition has tied up together in a strange knot these strands of festivity and fear it is over the cups of christmas eve that men have always competed in telling ghost stories this first element was present in dickens and it is very powerfully present in oliver twist it had not been present with sufficient consistency or continuity in pickwick to make it remain on the reader's memory at all for the tale of gabriel grubb is grotesque rather than horrible and the two gloomy stories of the madman and the queer client are so utterly irrelevant to the tale that even if the reader remember them he probably does not remember that they occur in pickwick critics have complained of shakespeare and others for putting comic episodes into a tragedy it required a man with the courage and coarseness of dickens actually to put tragic episodes into a farce but they are not caught up into the story at all in oliver twist however the thing broke out with an almost brutal inspiration and those who had fallen in love with dickens for his generous buffoonery may very likely have been startled at receiving such very different fare at the next helping when you have bought a man's book because you like his writing about mrs wardle's punch bowl and mr winkle's skates it may very well be surprising to open it and read about the sickening thuds that beat out the life of nancy or that mysterious villain whose face was blasted with disease as a nightmare the work is really admirable characters which are not very clearly conceived as regards their own psychology are yet at certain moments managed so as to shake to its foundations our own psychology bill sykes is not exactly a real man but for all that he is a real murderer nancy is not really impressive as a living woman but as the phrase goes she makes a lovely corpse something quite childish and eternal in us something which is shocked with the mere simplicity of death quivers when we read of those repeated blows or see sykes cursing the tell-tale cur who will follow his bloody footprints and this strange sublime vulgar melodrama which is melodrama and yet is painfully real reaches its hideous height in that fine scene of the death of sykes the besieged house the boys screaming within the crowd screaming without the murderer turned almost a maniac and dragging his victim uselessly up and down the room the escape over the roof the rope swiftly running taut and death sudden startling and symbolic a man hanged there is in this and similar scenes something of the quality of hogarth and many other english moralists of the early eighteenth century it is not easy to define this hogarthian quality in words beyond saying that is as a sort of alphabetical realism like the cruel candor of children but it has about it these two special principles which separate it from all that we call realism in our time first that with us a moral story means a story about moral people with them a moral story meant more often a story about immoral people second that with us realism is always associated with some subtle view of morals with them realism was always associated with some simple view of morals the end of bill sykes exactly in the way that the law would have killed him this is a hogarthian incident it carries on that tradition of startling and shocking platitude all this element in the book was a sincere thing in the author but none the less it came from old soils from the graveyard and the gallows and the lane where the ghost walked dickens was always attracted to such things as forrester says with inimitable simplicity 
but for his strong sense might have fallen into the follies of spiritualism. As a matter of fact, like most of the men of strong sense in his tradition, Dickens was left with a half-belief in spirits, which became in practice a belief in bad spirits. The great disadvantage of those who have too much strong sense to believe in supernaturalism is that they keep last the low and little forms of the supernatural, such as omens, curses, spectres, and retributions, but find a high and happy supernaturalism quite incredible. Thus the Puritans denied the sacraments, but went on burning witches. This shadow does rest to some extent upon the rational English writers like Dickens supernaturalism was dying but its ugliest roots died last dickens would have found it easier to believe in a ghost than in a vision of the virgin with angels there for good or evil however was the root of the old diablerie in dickens and there it is in oliver twist but this was only the first of the new dickens elements which must have surprised those dickensians who eagerly bought his second book the second of the new dickens elements is equally indisputable and separate. It swelled afterward to enormous proportions in Dickens' work, but it really has its rise here. Again, as in the case of the element of diablerie, it would be possible to make technical exceptions in favor of Pickwick, just as there were quite inappropriate scraps of the gruesome element in Pickwick, so there are quite inappropriate allusions to this other topic in Pickwick. But nobody by merely reading Pickwick would even remember this topic. No one by merely reading Pickwick would know what this topic is. The third great subject of Dickens, this second great subject of the Dickens of Oliver Twist. This subject is social oppression. It is surely fair to say that no one could have gathered from Pickwick how this question boiled in the blood of the author of Pickwick. There are indeed passages, particularly in connection with Mr. Pickwick in The Debtor's Prison, which proves to us, looking back on a whole public career, that Dickens had been from the beginning bitter and inquisitive about the problem of our civilization. No one could have imagined at the time that this bitterness ran in an unbroken river under all the surges of that superb gaiety and exuberance. With Oliver Twist, this sterner side of Dickens was suddenly revealed. For the very first pages of Oliver Twist are stern even when they are funny. They amuse, but they cannot be enjoyed, as can the passages about the follies of Mr. Snodgrass or the humiliations of Mr. Winkle. The difference between the old easy humor and this new harsh humor is a difference not of degree but of kind. Dickens makes game of Mr. Bumble because he wants to kill Mr. Bumble. He made game of Mr. Winkle because he wanted him to live forever. Dickens has taken the sword in hand. Against what is he declaring war? It is just here that the greatness of Dickens comes in. It is just here that the difference lies between the pedant and the poet. Dickens enters the social and political war, and the first stroke he deals is not only significant but even startling. Fully to see this, we must appreciate the national situation. It was an age of reform, and even of radical reform. The world was full of radicals and reformers, but only too many of them took the line of attacking everything and anything that was opposed to some particular theory among the many political theories that possessed the end of the 18th century. Some had so much perfected the perfect theory of republicanism that they almost lay awake at night because Queen Victoria had a crown on her head. Others were so certain that mankind had hitherto been merely strangled in the bonds of the state that they saw truth only in the destruction of tariffs or in bylaws. The greater part of that generation held that clearness, economy, and a hard common sense would soon destroy the errors that had been erected by the superstition and sentimentalities of the past. In pursuance of this idea, many of the new men of the new century, quite confident that they were invigorating the new age, sought to destroy the old sentimental clericalism, the old sentimental feudalism, the old world belief in priests, the old world belief in patrons, and, among other things, the old world belief in beggars. They sought, among other things, to clear away the old visionary kindliness on the subject of vagrants. 
Hence those reformers enacted not only a new reform bill, but also a new poor law. In creating many other modern things, they created the modern workhouse. And when Dickens came out to fight, it was the first thing that he broke with his battle-axe. This is where Dickens' social revolt is of more value than mere politics, and avoids the vulgarity of the novel with a purpose. His revolt is not a revolt of the commercialist against the feudalist, of the nonconformist against the churchman, of the free trader against the protectionist, of the liberal against the Tory. If he were among us now, his revolt would not be the revolt of the socialist against the individualist, or of the anarchist against the socialist. His revolt was simply, and solely, the eternal revolt. It was the revolt of the weak against the strong. He did not dislike this or that argument for oppression. He disliked oppression. He disliked a certain look on the face of a man when he looks down on another man. And that look on the face is, indeed, the only thing in the world that we have really to fight between here and the fires of hell. That which pedants of that time and this time would have called the sentimentalism of Dickens was really simply the detached sanity of Dickens. He cared nothing for the fugitive explanations of the constitutional conservatives. He cared nothing for the fugitive explanations of the Manchester School. He would have cared quite as little for the fugitive explanations of the Fabian Society or of the modern scientific socialist. He saw that under many forms there was one fact, the tyranny of man over man, and he struck at it when he saw it, whether it was old or new. When he found that footmen and rustics were too much afraid of Sir Leicester Dedlock, he attacked Sir Leicester Dedlock. He did not care whether Sir Leicester Dedlock said he was attacking England, or whether Mr. Rouncewell, the ironmaster, said he was attacking an effete oligarchy. In that case, he pleased Mr. Rouncewell, the ironmaster, and displeased Sir Leicester Dedlock, the aristocrat. But when he found that Mr. Rouncewell's workmen were much too frightened of Mr. Rouncewell, then he displeased Mr. Rouncewell in turn. He displeased Mr. Rouncewell very much by calling him Mr. Bounderby. When he imagined himself to be fighting old laws, he gave a sort of vague and general approval to new laws. But when he came to the new laws, they had a bad time. When Dickens found that after a hundred economic arguments and granting a hundred economic considerations, the fact remained that paupers in modern workhouses were much too afraid of the beetle, just as vassals in an ancient castle were much too afraid of the deadlocks. Then he struck suddenly and at once. This is what makes the opening chapters of Oliver Twist so curious and important. The very fact of Dickens' distance from and independence of the elaborate financial arguments of his time makes more definite and dazzling his sudden assertion that he sees the old human tyranny in front of him, as plain as the sun at noonday. Dickens attacks the modern workhouse with a sort of inspired simplicity as of a boy in a fairy tale, who had wandered about, sword in hand, looking for ogres, and who had found an indisputable ogre. All the other people of his time are attacking things because they are bad economics, or because they are bad politics, or because they are bad science. He alone is attacking things because they are bad. All the others are radicals with a large R. He alone is radical with a small one. He encounters evil with that beautiful surprise which, as it is the beginning of all real pleasure, is also the beginning of all righteous indignation. He enters the workhouse just as Oliver Twist enters it, as a little child. This is the real power and pathos of that celebrated passage in the book which has passed into a proverb but which has not lost its terrible humor, even in being hackneyed. I mean, of course, the everlasting quotation about Oliver Twist asking for more. The real poignancy that there is in this idea is a very good study in that strong school of social criticism which Dickens represented. A modern realist describing the dreary workhouse would have made all the children utterly crushed, not daring to speak at all, not expecting anything, not hoping anything, past all possibility of affording even ironical contrast or a protest of despair. A modern, in short, 
would have made all the boys in the workhouse pathetic by making them all pessimists. But Oliver Twist is not pathetic because he is a pessimist. Oliver Twist is pathetic because he is an optimist. The whole tragedy of that incident is in the fact that he does expect the universe to be kind to him, that he does believe that he is living in a just world. He comes before the guardians as the ragged peasants of the French Revolution came before the kings and parliaments of Europe. That is to say, he comes, indeed with gloomy experiences, but he comes with a happy philosophy. He knows that there are wrongs of a man to be reviled, but he believes also that there are rights of a man to be demanded. It has often been remarked as a singular fact that the French poor, who stand in historic tradition as typical of all the desperate men who have dragged down tyranny, were, as a matter of fact, by no means worse off than the poor of many other European countries before the Revolution. The truth is that the French were tragic because they were better off. The others had known the sorrowful experiences, but they alone had known the splendid expectation and the original claims. It was just here that Dickens was so true a child of them, and of that happy theory so bitterly applied. They were the one oppressed people that simply asked for justice. They were the one parish boy who innocently asked for more. End of section 10. End of chapter 5. Oliver Twist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Appreciations and Criticisms of the Works of Charles Dickens by G. K. Chesterton. Section 11. Chapter 6. The Old Curiosity Shop. Part 1. Nothing is important except the fate of the soul, and literature is only redeemed from an utter triviality, surpassing that of noughts and crosses, by the fact that it describes not the world around us, or the things on the retina of the eye, or the enormous irrelevancy of encyclopedias, but some condition to which the human spirit can come. All good writers express the state of their souls, even as occurs in some cases of very good writers, if it is a state of damnation. The first thing that has to be realized about Dickens is this ultimate spiritual condition of the man, which lay behind all his creations. This Dickens state of mind is difficult to pick out in words, as are all elementary states of mind. They cannot be described, not because they are too subtle for words, but because they are too simple for words. Perhaps the nearest approach to a statement of it would be this, that Dickens expresses an eager anticipation of everything that will happen in the motley affairs of men. He looks at the quiet crowd waiting for it to be picturesque and to play the fool. He expects everything. He is torn with a happy hunger. Thackeray is always looking back to yesterday. Dickens is always looking forward to tomorrow. Both are profoundly humorous, for there is a humor of the morning and a humor of the evening. But the first guesses at what it will get, at all the grotesqueness and variety which a day may bring forth, the second looks back on what the day has been, and sees even its solemnities as slightly ironical. Nothing can be too extravagant for the laughter that looks forward, and nothing can be too dignified for the laughter that looks back. It is an idle but obvious thing, which many must have noticed, that we often find in the title of one of an author's books what might very well stand for a general description of all of them. Thus all Spencer's works might be called A Hymn to Heavenly Beauty, or all Mr. Bernard Shaw's bound books might be called You Never Can Tell. In the same way, the whole substance and spirit of Thackeray might be gathered under the general title Vanity Fair. In the same way, too, the whole substance and spirit of Dickens might be gathered under the general title Great Expectations. 
In a recent criticism on this position, I saw it remarked that all this is reading into Dickens something that he did not mean, and I have been told that it would have greatly surprised Dickens to be informed that he went down the broad road of the revolution. Of course it would. Criticism does not exist to say about authors the things that they knew themselves. It exists to say the things about them which they did not know themselves. If a critic says that the Iliad has a pagan rather than a Christian pity, or that it is full of pictures made by one epithet, of course he does not mean that Homer could have said that. If Homer could have said that, the critic would leave Homer to say it. The function of criticism, if it has a legitimate function at all, can only be one function, that of dealing with the subconscious part of the author's mind which only the critic can express, and not with the conscious part of the author's mind, which the author himself can express. Either criticism is no good at all, a very defensible position, or else criticism means saying about an author the very things that would have made him jump out of his boots. Doubtless, the name in this case, Great Expectations, is an empty coincidence, and indeed it is not in the books of the later Dickens period, the period of great expectations, that we should look for the best examples of this sanguine and expectant spirit, which is the essential of the man's genius. There are plenty of good examples of it, especially in the earlier works, but even in the earlier works there is no example of it more striking or more satisfactory than the old curiosity shop. It is particularly noticeable and the fact that its opening and original framework express the ideas of a random experience. A thing come across in the street, a single face in the crowd, followed until it tells its story. Though the thing ends in a novel, it begins in a sketch. It begins as one of the sketches by Bose. There is something unconsciously artistic in the very clumsiness of this opening. Master Humphrey starts to keep a scrapbook of all his adventures, and he finds that he can fill the whole scrapbook with the sequels and the developments of one adventure. He goes out to notice everybody, and he finds himself busily and variedly occupied only in watching somebody. In this there is a very profound truth about the true excitement and inexhaustible poetry of life. The truth is not so much that eternity is full of souls as that one soul can fill eternity. In strict art, there is something quite lame and lumbering about the way in which the benevolent old storyteller starts to tell many stories, and then drops away altogether, while one of his stories takes his place. But in a larger art, his collision with little Nell and his complete eclipse by her personality and narrative have a real significance. They suggest the random richness of such meetings and their uncalculated results. It makes the whole book a sort of splendid accident. It is not true, as is commonly said, that the Dickens pathos as pathos is bad. It is not true, as is still more commonly said, that the whole business about Little Nell is bad. The case is more complex than that. Yet complex as it is, it admits of one sufficiently clear distinction. Those who have written about the death of Little Nell have generally noticed the crudities of the character itself the little girl's unnatural and staring innocence, her constrained and awkward piety. But they have nearly all of them entirely failed to notice that there is in the death of little Nell one quite definite and really artistic idea. It is not an artistic idea that a little child should die rhetorically on the stage like Paul Dombey, and little Nell does not die rhetorically upon the stage like Paul Dombey. But it is an artistic idea that all the good powers and personalities in the story should set out in pursuit of one insignificant child to repair an injustice to her, should track her from town to town over England with all the resources of wealth, intelligence, and travel, and should all arrive too late. All the good fairies and all the kind magicians, all the just kings and all the gallant princes with chariots and flying dragons and armies and navies, go after one little child who had strayed into a wood and find her dead. That is the conception which Dickens' artistic instinct was really aiming at when he finally condemned little Nell to death, after keeping her, so to speak, so long 
with the rope around her neck. The death of Little Nell is open certainly to the particular denial which its enemies make about it. The death of Little Nell is not pathetic. It is perhaps tragic. It is in reality ironic. Here is a very good case of the injustice to Dickens on his purely literary side. It is not that I say that Dickens achieved what he designed. It is that the critics will not see what the design was. They go on talking of the death of Little Nell as if it were a mere example of maudlin description like the death of Little Paul. As a fact, it is not described at all, so it cannot be objectionable. It is not the death of Little Nell, but the life of Little Nell that I object to. In this in the actual picture of her personality, if you can call it personality, Dickens did fall into some of his facile vices. The real objection to much of his pathos belongs really to another part of his character. It is connected with his vanity, his voracity for all kinds of praise, his restive experimentalism, and even perhaps his envy. He strained himself to achieve pathos. His humor was inspiration, but his pathos was ambition. His laughter was lonely. He would have laughed on a desert island. But his grief was gregarious. He liked to move great masses of men, to melt them into tenderness, to play on the people as a great pianist plays on them, to make them mad or sad. His pathos was to him a way of showing his power, and for that reason it was really powerless. He could not help making people laugh, but he tried to make them cry. We come in this novel, as we often do come in his novels, upon hard lumps of unreality, upon a phrase that suddenly sickens. That is always due to his conscious despotism over the delicate feelings. That is always due to his love of fame as distinct from his love of fun. But it is not true that all Dickens' pathos is like this. It is not even true that all the passages about Little Nell are like this. There are two strands almost everywhere and they can be differentiated as the sincere and the deliberate. There is great difference between Dickens thinking about the tears of his characters and Dickens thinking about the tears of his audience. When all this is allowed, however, and the exaggerated contempt for the Dickens pathos is properly corrected, the broad fact remains that to pass from the solemn characters in this book to the comic characters in this book is to be like some Ulysses who should pass suddenly from the land of shadows to the mountain of the gods. Little Nell has her own position in careful and reasonable criticism. Even that wobbling old ass, her grandfather, has his position in it. Perhaps even the dissipated Fred, whom long acquaintance with Mr. Dick Swiveller has not made any less dismal in his dissipation, has a place in it also. But when we come to Swiveller and Samson Brass and Quilp, and Mrs. Jarley, then Fred and Nell and the grandfather simply do not exist. There are no such people in the story. The real hero and heroine of the old curiosity shop are, of course, Dick Swiveller and the Marchioness. It is significant in a sense that these two sane, strong, living, and lovable human beings are the only two, or almost the only two people in the story, who do not run after little Nell. They have something better to do than go on that shadowy chase after that cheerless phantom. They have to build up between them a true romance. Perhaps the one true romance in the whole of Dickens. Dick Swiveller really has all the half-heroic characteristics which make a man respected by a woman, and which are the male contribution to virtue. He is brave, magnanimous, sincere about himself, amusing, absurdly hopeful, Above all, he is both strong and weak. On the other hand, the Marchioness really has all the characteristics, the entirely heroic characteristics, which make a woman respected by a man. She is female, that is, she is at once incurably candid and incurably loyal. She is full of terrible common sense. She expects little pleasure for herself, and yet she can enjoy bursts of it above all. She is physically timid, and yet she can face anything. All this solid rocky romanticism is really implied in the speech and action of these two characters, and can be felt behind them all the time. Because they are the two most absurd people in the book, 
they are also the most vivid, human, and imaginable. There are two happy, really fine love affairs in Dickens, and I almost think only two. One is the happy courtship of Swiveller and the Marchioness. The other is the tragic courtship of Toots and Florence Dombey. When Dick Swiveller wakes up in a bed and sees the Marchioness playing cribbage, he thinks that he and she are a prince and a princess in a fairy tale. He thinks right. End of section 11, chapter 6, The Old Curiosity Shop, part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Appreciations and Criticisms of the Works of Charles Dickens by G. K. Chesterton Section 12, Chapter 6, The Old Curiosity Shop, Part 2 I speak thus seriously of such characters with a deliberate purpose, for the frivolous characters of Dickens are taken much too frivolously. It has been quite insufficiently pointed out that all the serious moral ideas that Dickens did contrive to express, he expressed altogether through this fantastic medium, in such figures as Swiveller and the Little Servant. The warmest upholder of Dickens would not go to the solemn or sentimental passages for anything fresh or suggestive in faith or philosophy. No one would pretend that the death of Little Dombey, with its What Are the Wild Waves Singing, told us anything new or real about death. A good Christian dying, one would imagine, not only would not know what the wild waves were saying, but would not care. No one would pretend that the repentance of old Paul Dombey throws any light on the psychology or philosophy of repentance. No doubt old Dombey, white-haired and amiable, was a great improvement on old Dombey, brown-haired and unpleasant. But in his case the softening of the heart seems to bear too close a resemblance to softening of the brain. Whether these serious passages are as bad as the critical people or as good as the sentimental people find them, at least they do not convey anything in the way of an illuminating glimpse of a bold suggestion about men's moral nature. The serious figures do not tell one anything about the human soul. The comic figures do. Take anything almost at random out of these admirable speeches of Dick Swiveller. Notice, for instance, how exquisitely Dickens has caught a certain very deep and delicate quality at the bottom of this idle kind of man. I mean that odd, impersonal sort of intellectual justice by which the frivolous fellow sees things as they are, and even himself as he is, and is above irritation. Mr. Swiveller, you remember, asks the Marchioness whether the Brass family ever talked about him. She nods her head with vivacity. Complimentary? inquired Mr. Swiveller. The motion of the little servant's head altered, but she says continued the little servant, that you ain't to be trusted. Well, do you know, Marchioness, said Mr. Swiveller thoughtfully, many people, not exactly professional people, but tradesmen, have had the same idea. The excellent citizen from whom I ordered this beer inclined strongly to that opinion. This philosophical freedom from all resentment, this strange love of truth which seems actually to come through carelessness, is the very real piece of spiritual observation. Even among liars there are two classes, one immeasurably better than another. The honest liar is the man who tells the truth about his old lies, who says on Wednesday I told a magnificent lie on Monday. He keeps the truth in circulation. No one version of things stagnates in him and becomes an evil secret. He does not have to live with old lies, a horrible domesticity. Mr. Swiveller may mislead the waiter about whether he has the money to pay, but he does not mislead his friend, and he does not mislead himself on the point. He is quite as well aware as any one can be of the accumulating falsity of his position of the gentleman who by his various debts has closed up all the streets into the Strand except one, and who is going to close that tonight with a pair of gloves. 
He shuts up the street with a pair of gloves, but he does not shut up his mind with a secret. The traffic of truth is still kept open through his soul. It is exactly in these absurd characters, then, that we can find a mass of psychological and ethical suggestion. This cannot be found in the serious characters, except indeed in some of the later experiments. There is a little of such psychological and ethical suggestion in figures like Gridley, like Jasper, like Bradley Headstone. But in these earlier books, at least, such as The Old Curiosity Shop, the grave or moral figures throw no light upon morals. I should maintain this generalization even in the presence of that apparent exception, the Christmas Carol, with its trio of didactic ghosts. Charity is certainly splendid, at once a luxury and a necessity, but Dickens is not most effective when he is preaching charity seriously. He is most effective when he is preaching it uproariously, when he is preaching it by means of massive personalities and vivid scenes. One might say that he is best not when he is preaching his human love, but when he is practicing it. In his grave pages he tells us to love men, but in his wild pages he creates men whom we can love. By his solemnity he commands us to love our neighbors, by his caricature he makes us love them. There is an odd literary question, which I wonder is not put more often in literature. How far can an author tell a truth without seeing it himself? Perhaps an actual example will express my meaning. I was once talking to a highly intelligent lady about Thackeray's Newcombs. We were speaking of the character of Mrs. Mackenzie, the campaigner, and in the middle of the conversation the lady leaned across to me and said in a low, hoarse, but emphatic voice, She drank. Thackeray didn't know it, but she drank. And it is really astonishing what a shaft of white light this sheds on the campaigner, on her terrible temperament, on her agonized abusiveness, and her almost more agonized urbanity, on her clamor which is nevertheless not open or execrable, on her temper which is not so much bad temper as insatiable, bloodthirsty, man-eating temper. How far can a writer thus indicate by accident a truth of which he is himself ignorant? If truth is a plan or a pattern of things that really are, or in other words, if truth really exists outside ourselves, or in other words, if truth exists at all, it must be often possible for a writer to uncover a corner of it which he happens not to understand, but which his reader does happen to understand. The author sees only two lines. The reader sees where they meet and what is the angle. The author sees only an arc or fragment of a curve. The reader sees the size of the circle. The last thing to say about Dickens, and especially about books like The Old Curiosity Shop, is that they are full of these unconscious truths. The careless reader may miss them. The careless author almost certainly did miss them. But from them can be gathered an impression of real truth to life, which is for the grave critics of Dickens an almost unknown benefit, buried treasure. Here, for instance, is one of them out of the old curiosity shop. I mean the passage in which, by a blazing stroke of genius, the dashing Mr. Chuckster, one of the glorious Apollos of whom Mr. Swiveller was the perpetual grand, is made to entertain a hatred bordering upon frenzy for the stolid, patient, respectful, and laborious kit. Now in the formal plan of the story, Mr. Chuckster is a fool, and Kit is almost a hero. At least he is a noble boy. Yet unconsciously Dickens made the idiot Chuckster say something profoundly suggestive on the subject. In speaking of Kit, Mr. Chuckster makes use of these two remarkable phrases, that Kit is meek and that he is a snob. Now Kit is really a very fresh and manly picture of a boy, firm, sane, chivalrous, reasonable, full of those three great Roman virtues which Mr. Belloc has so often celebrated, virtues and vercundia and paetas. He is a sympathetic but still a straightforward study of the best type of that most respectable of all human classes, the respectable poor. All this is true. All that Dickens utters in praise of Kit is true. Nevertheless, the awful words of Chuckster remain written on the eternal skies. Kit is meek, 
and Kit is a snob. His natural dignity does not include and is partly marred by that instinctive subservience to the employing class which has been the comfortable weakness of the whole English democracy, which has prevented their making any revolution for the last two hundred years. Kit would not serve any wicked man for money, but he would serve any moderately good man, and the money would give a certain dignity and decisiveness to the goodness. All this is the English popular evil which goes along with the English popular virtues of geniality, of homeliness, tolerance, and strong humor, hope, and an enormous appetite for hand-to-mouth happiness. The scene in which Kit takes his family to the theatre is a monument of the massive qualities of old English enjoyment. If what we want is Merry England, our antiquarians ought not to revive the Maypole or the Morris dancers. They ought to revive Astley and Sadler's Wells and the old solemn circus and the old stupid pantomime and all the sawdust and all the oranges. Of all this strength and joy in the poor, Kit is a splendid and final symbol. But amid all his masculine and English virtue, he has this weak touch of meekness or acceptance of the powers that be. It is a sound touch. It is a real truth about Kit. But Dickens did not know it. Mr. Chuckster did. Dickens' stories, taken as a whole, have more artistic unity than appears at the first glance. It is the immediate impulse of a modern critic to dismiss them as mere disorderly scrapbooks with very brilliant scraps. But this is not quite so true as it looks. In one of Dickens' novels there is generally no particular unity of construction, but there is often a considerable unity of sentiment and atmosphere. Things are irrelevant, but not somehow inappropriate. The whole book is written carelessly, but the whole book is generally written in one mood. To take a rude parallel from the other arts, we may say that there is not much unity of form, but there is much unity of color. In most of the novels this can be seen. Nicholas Nickleby, as I have remarked, is full of a certain freshness, a certain light and open-air curiosity, which irradiates from the image of the young man swinging along the Yorkshire roads in the sun. Hence the comic characters with whom he falls in are comic characters in the same key. They are a band of strolling players, charlatans and poseurs, but too humane to be called humbugs. In the same way, the central story of Oliver Twist is somber, and hence even its comic character is almost somber. At least he is too ugly to be merely amusing. Mr. Bumble is in some ways a terrible grotesque. His apoplectic vision calls the fire-red cherubim's face, which added such horror to the height and stature of Chaucer's Sompreneur. In both these cases, even the riotous and absurd characters are a little touched with the tint of the whole story. But this neglected merit of Dickens can certainly be seen best in the old curiosity shop. The curiosity shop itself was a lumber of grotesque and sinister things, outlandish weapons, twisted and diabolic decorations. The comic characters in the book are all like images brought in an old curiosity shop. Quilp might be a gargoyle. He might be some sort of devilish door-knocker dropped down and crawling about the pavement. The same applies to the sinister and really terrifying stiffness of Sally Brass. She is like some old staring figure cut out of wood. Samson Brass, her brother, again is a grotesque in the same rather inhuman manner. He is especially himself when he comes in with the green shade over his eye. About all this group of bad figures in the old curiosity shop, there is a sort of diablerie. There is also within this atmosphere an extraordinary energy of irony and laughter. The scene in which Samson Brass draws up the description of Quilp, supposing him to be dead, reaches a point of fiendish fun. We will not say very bandy, Mrs. Genoan, he says, of his friend's legs. We will confine ourselves to bandy. He is gone, my friends, where his legs would never be called in question. They go on to the discussion of his nose, and Mrs. Ginnewip inclines to the view that it is flat. Aquiline, you hag, aquiline, cries Mr. Quilp. 
pushing in his head and striking his nose with his fist. There is nothing better in the whole brutal exuberance of the character than that gesture with which Quill punches his own face with his own fist. It is indeed a perfect symbol, for Quilp is always fighting himself for want of anybody else. He is energy, and energy by itself is always suicidal. He is that primordial energy which tears and which destroys itself. The end of section 12, the end of chapter 6, The Old Curiosity Shop. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Appreciations and Criticisms of the Works of Charles Dickens by G. K. Chesterton Section 13 Chapter 7 Barnaby Rudge Barnaby Rudge was written by Dickens in the spring, and the first flowing tide of his popularity. It came immediately after the old curiosity shop, and only a short time after Pickwick. Dickens was one of those rare but often very sincere men in whom the high moment of success almost coincides with the high moment of youth. The calls upon him at the time were insistent and overwhelming. This necessarily happens at a certain stage of a successful writer's career. He was just successful enough to invite offers, and not successful enough to reject them. At the beginning of his career he could throw himself into Pickwick, because there was nothing else to throw himself into. At the end of his life he could throw himself into A Tale of Two Cities, because he refused to throw himself into anything else. But there was an intervening period, early in his life, when there was almost too much work for his imagination, and yet not quite enough work for his housekeeping. To this period Barnaby Rudge belongs, and it is a curious tribute to the quite curious greatness of Dickens, that in this period of youthful strain we do not feel the strain, but feel only the youth. His own amazing wish to write equaled or outstripped even his reader's amazing wish to read. Working too hard did not cure him of his abstract love of work. Unreasonable publishers asked him to write ten novels at once, but he wanted to write twenty novels at once. All this period is strangely full of his own sense at once of fertility and of futility. He did work which no one else could have done, and yet he could not be certain as yet that he was anybody. Barnaby Rudge marks this epoch because it marks the fact that he is still confused about what kind of person he is going to be. He has already struck the note of the normal romance in Nicholas Nickleby. He has already created some of his highest comic characters in Pickwick and the Old Curiosity Shop. But here he betrays the fact that it is still a question what ultimate guide he shall follow. Barnaby Rudge is a romantic historical novel. Its design reminds us of Scott. Some parts of its fulfillment remind us, alas, of Harrison Ainsworth. It is a very fine romantic historical novel. Scott would have been proud of it, but it is still so far different from the general work of Dickens that it is permissible to wonder how far Dickens was proud of it. The book, effective as it is, is almost entirely devoted to dealings with a certain artistic element, which in its mere isolation Dickens did not commonly affect, an element which many men of infinitely less genius have often seemed to affect more successfully. I mean the element of the picturesque. It is the custom in many quarters to speak somewhat sneeringly of that element, which is broadly called the picturesque. It's always felt to be inferior, a vulgar and even an artificial form of art. Yet two things may be remarked about it. The first is that, with few exceptions, the greatest literary artists have been not only particularly clever at the picturesque, but particularly fond of it. 
Shakespeare, for instance, delighted in certain merely pictorial contrasts, which are quite distinct from, even when they are akin to, the spiritual view involved. For instance, there is an admirable satire in the idea of Touchstone, teaching worldly wisdom and worldly honor to the woodland yokels. There is excellent philosophy in the idea of the fool being the representative of civilization in the forest. But quite apart from this deeper meaning in the incident, the mere figure of the jester, in his bright motley and his cap and bells, against the green background of the forest and the rude forms of the shepherds, is a strong example of the purely picturesque. There is excellent tragic irony in the confrontation of the melancholy philosopher among the tombs with the cheerful digger of the graves. It sums up the essential point, that dead bodies can be comic. It is only dead souls that can be tragic. But quite apart from such irony, the mere picture of the grotesque grave digger, the black clad prince and the skull, is a picture in the strongest sense picturesque. Caliban and the two shipwrecked drunkards are an admirable symbol, but they are also an admirable scene. Bottom, with the ass's head, sitting in rings of elves, is excellent moving comedy, but also excellent still life. Falstaff, with his huge body, Bardolph, with his burning nose, are masterpieces of the pen, but they would be fine sketches even for the pencil. King Lear in the storm is a landscape as well as a character study. There is something decorative even about the insistence on the swarthiness of Othello or the deformity of Richard the Third. Shakespeare's work is much more than picturesque, but it is picturesque, and the same which is said here of him by way of example is largely true of the highest class of literature. Dante's Divine Comedy is supremely important as philosophy, but it is important merely as a panorama. Spencer's Fairy Queens pleases us as an allegory, but it would please us even as a wallpaper. Stronger still is the case of Chaucer, who loved the pure picturesque, which always includes something of what we commonly call the ugly. The huge stature and startling scarlet face of the Sompnour is in just the same spirit as Shakespeare's skulls and motley. The same spirit gave Chaucer's Miller bagpipes and clad his doctor in crimson. It is the spirit which, while making many other things, loves to make a picture. Now the second thing to be remarked in apology for the picturesque is that the very thing which makes it seem trivial ought really to make it seem important. I mean the fact that it consists necessarily of contrasts. It brings together types that stand out from their background but are abruptly different from each other like the clown among the fairies or the fool in the forest. And his audacious reconciliation is a mark not of frivolity but of extreme seriousness. A man who deals in harmonies, who only matches stars with angels or lambs with spring flowers, he indeed may be frivolous, for he is taking one mood at a time and perhaps forgetting each mood as it passes. But a man who ventures to combine an angel and an octopus must have some serious view of the universe. The man who should write a dialogue between two early Christians might be a mere writer of dialogues. But a man who should write a dialogue between an early Christian and the missing link would have to be a philosopher. The more widely different the types talked of, the more serious and universal must be the philosophy which talks of them. The mark of the light and thoughtless writer is the harmony of his subject matter. The mark of the thoughtful writer is its apparent diversity. The most flippant lyric poet might write a pretty poem about lambs, but it requires something bolder and graver than a poet. It requires an ecstatic prophet to talk about the lion lying down with the lamb. Dickens, at any rate, strongly supports this conception that great literary men as such do not despise the purely pictorial. No man's works have so much the quality of illustrating themselves. Few men's works have been more thoroughly and eagerly illustrated. Few men's works can it have been better fun to illustrate. As a rule, this fascinating quality in the mere fantastic figures of the tale 
was inseparable from their farcical quality in the tale. Stiggins' red nose is distinctly connected with the fact that he is a member of the Ebenezer Temperance Association. Quilp is little because a little of him goes a long way. Mr. Carker smiles and smiles and is a villain. Mr. Shadband is fat because in his case to be fat is to be hated. The story is immeasurably more important than the picture. It is not mere indulgence in the picturesque. Generally, it is an intellectual love of the comic, not a pure love of the grotesque. But in one book, Dickens suddenly confesses that he likes the grotesque even without the comic. In one case, he makes clear that he enjoys pure pictures with a pure love of the picturesque. That place is Barnaby Rudge. There had indeed been hints of it in many episodes in his books, notably, for example, in that fine scene in the death of Quilp, a scene in which the dwarf remains fantastic long after he has ceased to be in any way funny. Still, the dwarf was meant to be funny. Humor of a horrible kind, but still humor, is the purpose of Quilp's existence and position in the book. Laughter is the object of all his oddities, but the laughter is not the object of Barnaby Rudge's oddities. His idiot costume and his ugly raven are used for the purpose of the pure grotesque, solely to make a certain kind of gothic sketch. It is commonly this love of pictures that drives men back upon the historical novel, but it is very typical of Dickens' living interest in his own time, that though he wrote two historical novels, they were neither of them very ancient history. They were both, indeed, a very recent history. Only they were those parts of recent history which were especially picturesque. I do not think that this was due to any mere consciousness on his part that he knew no history. Undoubtedly he knew no history, and he may or may not have been conscious of the fact. But the consciousness did not prevent him from writing a history of England, nor did it prevent him from interlarding all or any of his works with tales of the pictorial past, such as the tale of the broken swords in Master Humphrey's clock, or the indefensibly delightful nightmare of the lady in the stagecoach, which helps to soften the amiable end of Pickwick. Neither, worst of all, did it prevent him from dogmatizing anywhere and everywhere about the past, of which he knew nothing. It did not prevent him from telling the bells to tell Trotty Vec that the Middle Ages were a failure, nor from solemnly declaring that the best thing that the medieval monks did was to create the mean and snobbish quietude of a modern cathedral city. No, it was not historical reverence that held him back from dealing with the remote past, but rather something much better, a living interest in the living century in which he was born. He would have thought himself quite intellectually capable of writing a novel about the Council of Trent or the First Crusade. He would have thought himself quite equal to analyzing the psychology of Abelard, or giving a bright, satiric sketch of St. Augustine. It must frankly be confessed that it was not a sense of his own unworthiness that held him back. I fear it was rather a sense of St. Augustine's unworthiness. He could not see the point of any history before the first slow swell of the French Revolution. He could understand the revolutions of the eighteenth century. All the other revolutions of history so many and so splendid, were unmeaning to him. But the revolutions of the eighteenth century he did understand, and to them therefore he went back, as all historical novelists go back, in search of the picturesque. And from this fact an important result follows. The result that follows is this, that his only two historical novels are both tales of revolutions, of eighteenth century revolutions, these two eighteenth-century revolutions may seem to differ, and perhaps do differ in everything except in being revolutions, and of the eighteenth century. The French Revolution, which is the theme of a tale of two cities, was a revolt in favor of all that is now called enlightenment and liberation. The great Gordon Riot, which is the theme of Barnaby Rudge, was a revolt in favor of something which would now be called mere ignorant and obscurantist Protestantism. Nevertheless, both belonged more typically to the age out of which Dickens came, the great skeptical and yet creative eighteenth century of Europe. 
whether a mob rose on the right side or the wrong they both belonged to the time in which a mob could rise in which a mob could conquer no growth of intellectual science or of moral cowardice had made it impossible to fight in the streets whether for the republic or for the bible if we wish to know what was the real link existing actually in ultimate truth existing unconsciously in dickens mind which connected the gordon riots with the french revolution the link may be defined though not with any great adequacy the nearest and truest way of stating it is that neither of the two could possibly happen in fleet street tomorrow evening another point of resemblance between the two books might be found in the fact that they both contain the sketch of the same kind of eighteenth-century aristocrat if indeed that kind of aristocrat really existed in the eighteenth century the diabolical dandy with the rapier and the sneer is at any rate a necessity of all normal plays and romances hence mr chester has a right to exist in this romance and foulon a right to exist in a page of history almost as cloudy and disreputable as a romance what dickens and other romancers do probably admit from the picture of the eighteenth-century oligarch is probably his liberality it must never be forgotten that even when he was a despot in practice he was generally a liberal in theory dickens and romancers make the pre-revolution tyrant a sincere believer in tyranny generally he was not he was a sceptic about everything even about his own position the romantic foulon says of the people let them eat grass with bitter and deliberate contempt the real foulon if ever he said it at all probably said it as a sort of dreary joke because he couldn't think of any other way out of the problem simply mr chester a cynic as he is believed seriously in the beauty of being a gentleman a real man of that type probably disbelieved in that as in everything else dickens was too bracing one may say too bouncing himself to understand the psychology of fatigue in a protected and leisured class he could understand a tyrant like quilp a tyrant who is on his throne because he has climbed up into it like a monkey he could not understand a tyrant who is on his throne because he is too weary to get out of it the old aristocrats were in a dead way quite good-natured they were even humanitarians which perhaps accounts for the extent to which they roused against themselves the healthy hatred of humanity but they were tired humanitarians tired with doing nothing figures like that of mr chester therefore fail somewhat to give the true sense of something hopeless and helpless which led men to despair of the upper class he has a boyish pleasure in play-acting he has an interest in life being a villain is his hobby but the true man of that type had found all hobbies fail him he had wearied of himself as he had wearied of a hundred women he was graceful and could not even admire himself in the glass he was witty and could not even laugh at his own jokes dickens could never understand tedium there is no mark more strange and perhaps sinister of the interesting and not very sane condition of our modern literature than the fact that tedium has been admirably described in it our best modern writers are never so exciting as they are about dullness mr rudyard kipling is never so powerful as when he is painting yawning deserts aching silences sleeping nights or infernal isolation the excitement in one of the stories of mr henry james becomes tense thrilling and almost intolerable in all the half hours during which nothing whatever is said or done we are entering again into the mind into the real mind of foulon and mr chester we begin to understand the deep despair of those tyrants whom our fathers pulled down but dickens could never have understood that despair it was not in his soul and it is an interesting coincidence that here in this book of barnaby rudge there is a character meant to be wholly grotesque who nevertheless expresses much of that element in dickens which prevented him from being a true interpreter of the tired and sceptical aristocrat. Sim Tappertite is a fool, but a perfectly honorable fool. It requires some sincerity to pose. Posing means that one has not dried up in oneself all the youthful and innocent vanities, with that slow paralysis of mere pride. Posing means that one is still fresh enough to enjoy the good opinion of one's fellows. 
On the other hand, the true cynic has not enough truth in him to attempt affectation. He has never even seen the truth, far less tried to imitate it. Now we might very well take the type of Mr. Chester on the one hand, and of Sim Tappertite on the other, as marking the issue, the conflict, and the victory, which really ushered in the nineteenth century. Dickens was very like Sim Tappertite. The liberal revolution was very like a Sim Tappertite revolution. It was vulgar. It was overdone. It was absurd. But it was alive. Dickens was vulgar was absurd, overdid everything, but he was alive. The aristocrats were perfectly correct, but quite dead, dead long before they were guillotined. The classics and critics who lamented that Dickens was no gentleman were quite right, but quite dead. The revolution thought itself rational, but so did Sim Tappertite. It was really a huge revolt of romanticism against a reason which had grown sick even of itself. Sim Tappertite rose against Mr. Chester, and, thank God, he put his foot upon his neck. End of section 13 The end of chapter 7 Barnaby Rudge This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Appreciations and Criticisms of the Works of Charles Dickens by G. K. Chesterton Section 14 Chapter 8 American Notes American Notes was written soon after Dickens had returned from his first visit to America. That visit had, of course, been a great epoch in his life. But how much of an epoch men did not truly realize until some time after, in the middle of a quiet story about Salisbury and a ridiculous architect. His feelings flamed out and flared up to the stars in Martin Chuzzlewit. In the American notes, however, are not interesting because in them he betrays his feelings when he does not know that he is betraying them. Dickens' first visit to America was, from his own point of view, and at the beginning, a happy and festive experiment. It is very characteristic of him that he went among the Americans, enjoyed them, even admired them, and then had a quarrel with them. Nothing was ever so unmistakable as his good will, except his ill will and they were never far apart. And this was not, as some bloodless moderns have sneeringly insinuated, a mere repetition of the proximity between the benevolent stage and the quarrelsome stage of drink. It was a piece of pure optimism. He believed so readily that men were going to be good to him, that an injury to him was something more than an injury. It was a shock. What was the exact nature of the American shock must, however, be more carefully stated. The famous quarrel between Dickens and America, which finds its most elaborate expression in American notes, though its most brilliant expression in Martin Chuzzlewit, is an incident about which a great deal remains to be said. But the thing which most specially remains to be said is this. This old Anglo-American quarrel was much more fundamentally friendly than most Anglo-American alliances. In Dickens' day, each nation understood the other enough to argue. In our time neither nation understands itself even enough to quarrel. There was an English tradition from Fox and 18th century England. There was an American tradition from Franklin and 18th century America, and they were still close enough together to discuss their differences with acrimony, perhaps, but with certain fundamental understandings. The eighteenth-century belief in a liberal civilization was still a dogma, for dogma is the only thing that makes argument or reasoning possible. America, under all its swagger, did still really believe that Europe was its fountain and its mother, because Europe was more fully civilized. Dickens, under all his disgust, did still believe that America was in advance of Europe, 
because it was more democratic. It was an age, in short, in which the word progress could still be used reasonably, because the whole world looked to one way of escape, and there was only one kind of progress under discussion. Now, of course, progress is a useless word, for progress takes for granted an already defined direction, and it is exactly about the direction that we disagree. Do not let us therefore be misled into any mistaken optimism or special self-congratulation upon what many people would call the improved relations between England and America. The relations are improved because America has finally become a foreign country, and with foreign countries all sane men take care to exchange a certain consideration and courtesy. But even as late as the time of Dickens' first visit to the United States, we English still felt America as a colony, an insolent, offensive, and even unintelligible colony sometimes, but still a colony, a part of our civilization, a limb of our life. And America itself, as I have said, under all its bounce and independence, really regarded us as a mother country. This being the case, it was possible for us to quarrel like kinsmen. Now we only bow and smile like strangers. This tone, as a sort of family responsibility, can be felt quite specially all through the satires or suggestions of these American notes. Dickens is cross with America, because he is worried about America as if he were its father. He explores its industrial, legal, and educational arrangements like a mother looking at the housekeeping of a married son. He makes suggestions with a certain acidity. He takes a strange pleasure in being pessimistic. He advises them to take note how much better certain things are done in England. All this is very different from Dickens' characteristic way of dealing with a foreign country. In countries really foreign, such as France, Switzerland, and Italy, he had two attitudes, neither of them in the least worried or paternal. When he found a thing in Europe which he did not understand, such as the Roman Catholic Church, he simply called it an old-world superstition and sat looking at it like a moonlit ruin. When he found something that he did understand, such as luncheon baskets, he burst into carols of praise over the superior sense in our civilization and good management to continental methods. An example of the first attitude may be found in one of his letters, in which he describes the backwardness and idleness of Catholics who would not build a Birmingham in Italy. He seems quite unconscious of the obvious truth that the backwardness of Catholics was simply the refusal of Bob Cratchit to enter the house of Gradgrind. An example of the second attitude can be found in the purple patches of fun in Mugby Junction, in which the English waitress denounces the profligate French habit of providing new bread and clean food for people travelling by rail. The point is, however, that in neither case has he the air of one suggesting improvements or sharing a problem with the people engaged on it. He does not go carefully with a notebook through Jesuit schools, nor offer friendly suggestions to the governors of Parisian prisons. Or, if he does, it is in different spirit. It is in the spirit of an ordinary tourist being shown over the Colosseum or the pyramids. But he visited America in the spirit of a government inspector, dealing with something it was his duty to inspect. This is never felt either in his praise or blame of continental countries. When he did not leave a foreign country to decay like a dead dog, he merely watched it at play like a kitten. France he mistook for a kitten, Italy he mistook for a dead dog. But with America he could feel and fear. There he could hate because he could love. There he could feel not the past alone nor the present, but the future also, and like all brave men when he saw the future he was a little afraid of it. For all tests by which good citizen and strong reformer can be distinguished from the vague faddist and inhuman skeptic, I know no better test than this, that the unreal reformer sees in front of him one certain future, the future of his fad, while the real reformer sees before him ten or twenty futures among which his country must choose, and may in some dreadful hour choose the wrong one. 
The true patriot is always doubtful of victory because he knows that he is dealing with a living thing, a thing with free will. To be certain of free will is to be uncertain of success. The subject matter of the real difference of opinion between Dickens and the public of America can only be understood if it is thus treated as a dispute between brothers about the destiny of a common heritage. The point at issue might be stated like this. Dickens, on his side, did not in his heart doubt for a moment that England would eventually follow America along the road towards real political equality and purely republican institutions. He lived, it must be remembered, before the revival of aristocracy, which has since overwhelmed us. The revival of aristocracy works through popular science and commercial dictatorship, and which has nowhere been more manifest than in America itself. He knew nothing of this. In his heart he conceded to the Yankees that not only was their revolution right, but would ultimately be completed everywhere. But on the other hand, his whole point against the American experiment was this that if it ignored certain ancient English contributions, it would go to pieces for lack of them. Of this, the first was good manners, and the second, individual liberty. Liberty, that is, to speak and write against the trend of the majority. In these things he was much more serious and much more sensible than it is the fashion to think he was. He was indeed one of the most serious and sensible critics England has ever had of current and present problems, though his criticism is useless to the point of non-entity about all things remote from him in style of civilization or in time. His point about good manners is really important. All his grumblings through his book of American notes, all his shrieking satire in Martin Chuzzlewit, are expressions of a grave and reasonable fear he had touching the future of democracy. And remember again what has been already remarked instinctively he paid America the compliment of looking at her as the future of democracy. The mistake which he attacked still exists. I cannot imagine why it is that social equality is somehow supposed to mean social familiarity. Why should equality mean that all men are equally rude? Should it not rather mean that all men are equally polite? Might it not quite reasonably mean that all men should be equally ceremonious and stately and pontifical? What is there especially equalitarian, for instance, in calling your political friends and even your political enemies by their Christian names in public? There is something very futile in the way in which certain socialist leaders call each other Tom, Dick, and Harry, especially when Tom is accusing Harry of having basely imposed upon the well-known imbecility of Dick. There is something quite undemocratic in all men calling each other by the special and affectionate term comrade especially when they say it with a sneer and smart inquiry about the funds. Democracy would be quite satisfied if every man called every other man sir. Democracy would have no conceivable reason to complain if every man called every other man your excellency or your holiness or brother of the sun and moon. The only democratic essential is that it should be a term of dignity and that it should be given to all. To abolish all terms of dignity is no more specially democratic than the Roman emperor's wish to cut off everybody's head at once was especially democratic. That involved equality, certainly, but it was lacking in respect. Dickens saw America as markedly the seat of this danger. He saw that there was a perilous possibility that republican ideals might be allied to a social anarchy, good neither for them nor for any other ideals. Republican simplicity, which is difficult, might be quickly turned into bohemian brutality, which is easy. Cincinnatus, instead of putting his hand to the plough, might put his feet on the tablecloth, and an impression prevail that it was all part of the same rugged equality and freedom. Insolence might become a tradition. Bad manners might have all the sanctity of good manners. There you are, cries Martin Chuzzlewit indignantly, when the American has befouled the butter. A man deliberately makes a hog of himself, and that is an institution. But the thread of thought, which we must always keep in hand in this matter, is that he would not thus have worried about the degradation of republican simplicity into general rudeness, if he had not from first to last instinctively felt that America held human democracy in her hand. To exalt it, 
or to let it fall. In one of his gloomier moments he wrote down his fear that the greatest blow ever struck at liberty would be struck by America in the failure of her mission upon the earth. This brings us to the other ground of his alarm, the matter of liberty of speech. Here also he was much more reasonable and philosophic than has commonly been realized. The truth is that the lurid individualism of Carlyle has, with its violent colors, killed the tones of most criticism of his time. And just as we can often see a scheme of decoration better if we cover some flaming picture, so you can judge nineteenth-century England much better if you leave Carlyle out. He is important to moderns because he led that return to Toryism which has been the chief feature of modernity. But his judgments were often not only spiritually false, but really quite superficial. Dickens understood the dangers of democracy far better than Carlyle, just as he understood the merits of democracy far better than Carlyle. And of this fact we can produce one plain evidence in the manner of which we speak. Carlyle, in general dislike of the revolutionary movement, lumped liberty and democracy together and said that the chief objection to democracy was that it involved the excess and misuse of liberty. He called democracy anarchy or no rule. Dickens, with far more philosophical insight and spiritual delicacy, saw that the real danger of democracy is that it tends to the very opposite of anarchy, even to the very opposite of liberty. He lamented in America the freedom of manners, but he lamented even more the absence of freedom of opinion. I believe there is no country on the face of the earth, he says, where there is less freedom of opinion on any subject in reference to which there is a broad difference of opinion than in this. There I write the words with reluctance, disappointment, and sorrow, but I believe it from the bottom of my soul. The notion that I, a man alone by myself in America, should venture to suggest to the Americans that there was one point on which they were neither just to their own countrymen nor to us actually struck the boldest dumb. Washington, Irving, Prescott, Hoffman, Bryant, Halleck, Dana, Washington, Alliston. Every man who writes in this country is devoted to the question, and not one of them dares to raise his voice and complain of the atrocious state of the law. The wonder is that a breathing man can be found with temerity enough to suggest to the Americans the possibility of their having done wrong. I wish you could have seen the faces that I saw down both sides of the table at Hartford when I began to talk about Scott. I wish you could have heard how I gave it out. My blood so boiled when I thought of the monstrous injustice that I felt, as if it were twelve feet high when I thrust it down their throats. Dickens knew no history, but he had all history behind him in feeling that a pure democracy does tend, when it goes wrong, to be too traditional and absolute. The truth is indeed a singular example of the unfair attack upon democracy in our own time. Everybody can repeat the platitude that the mob can be the greatest of all tyrants, but few realize or remember the corresponding truth which goes along with it, that the mob is the only permanent and unassailable high priest. Democracy drives its traditions too hard, but democracy is the only thing that keeps any traditions. An aristocracy must always be going after some new thing. The severity of democracy is far more of a virtue than is liberty. The decorum of a democracy is far more of a danger than is lawlessness. Dickens discovered this in his great quarrels about the copyright, when a whole nation acted on a small point of opinion as if it were going to lynch him. But fortunately for the purpose of this argument, there is no need to go back to the forties for such a case. Another great literary man has of late visited America, and it is possible that Maxim Gorky may be in a position to state how far democracy is likely to err on the side of mere liberty and laxity. He may have found, like Dickens, some freedom of manners. He did not find much freedom of morals. Along with such American criticism should really go his very characteristic summary of the questions of the Red Indian. It marks the combination between the mental narrowness and the moral justice of the old liberal. Dickens can see nothing in the Red Indian except that he is barbaric, retrograde, bellicose, 
uncleanly and superstitious in short that he is not a member of the special civilization of birmingham or brighton it is curious to note the contrast between the cheery nay cockney contempt with which dickens speaks of the american indian and that chivalrous and pathetic essay in which washington irving celebrates the virtues of the vanishing race between washington irving and his friend charles dickens there was always indeed this ironical comedy of inversion it is amusing that the englishman should have been the pushing and even pert modernist and the american the stately antiquarian and lover of lost causes but while a man of more mellow sympathies may well dislike dickens dislike of savages and even disdain his disdain he ought to sharply remind himself of the admirably ethical fairness and equity which meet with that restricted outlook in the very act of describing red indians as devils who like so much dirt it would pay us to sweep away he pauses to deny emphatically that we have any right to sweep them away we have no right to wrong the man he means to say even if he himself be a kind of wrong here we strike the ringing iron of the old conscience and sense of honor which marked the best men of his party and of his epoch this rigid and even reluctant justice towers at any rate far above modern views of savages above the sentimentalism of the mere humanitarian and the far weaker sentimentalism that pleads for brutality to wrong people because they are nasty or humanitarian who cannot be just to them without pretending that they are nice The end of section 14, chapter 8, American Notes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Appreciations and Criticisms of the Works of Charles Dickens by G. K. Chesterton Section 15, Chapter 9, Pictures from Italy The pictures from Italy are excellent in themselves, and excellent as a foil to the American notes. Here we have none of that air of giving decisions like a judge, or sending in a report like an inspector. Here we have only glimpses, light, and even fantastic glimpses of a world that is really alien to Dickens. It is so alien that he can almost entirely enjoy it, for no man can entirely enjoy that which he loves. Contentment is always unpatriotic. The difference can indeed be put with approximate perfection in one phrase in italy he was on a holiday in america he was on a tour but indeed dickens himself has quite sufficiently conveyed the difference in the two phrases that he did actually use for the titles of the two books dickens often told unconscious truths especially in small matters the american notes really are notes like the notes of a student or a professional witness the pictures from italy are only pictures from italy like the miscellaneous pictures that all tourists bring from Italy. To take another and perhaps closer figure of speech, almost all Dickens' works, such as these, may best be regarded as private letters addressed to the public. His private correspondence was quite as brilliant as his public works, and many of his public works are almost as formless and casual as his private correspondence. If he had been struck insensible for a year, I really think that his friends and family could have brought out one of his best books by themselves if they had happened to keep his letters. The homogeneity of his public and private work was indeed strange in many ways. On the one hand, there was little that was pompously and unmistakably public in the publications, and on the other hand, there is very little that was private in the private letters. His hilarity had almost a kind of hardness about it. No man's letters, I should think, ever needed less expurgation on the ground of weakness or undue confession. 
the main part and certainly the best part of such a book as pictures from italy can certainly be criticized best as part of that perpetual torrent of entertaining autobiography which he flung at his children as if they were his readers and his readers as if they were his children there are some brilliant patches of sense and nonsense in this book but there is always something accidental in them as if they might have occurred somewhere else perhaps the most attractive of them is the incomparable description of the italian marionette theatre in which they acted a play about the death of napoleon in st helena the description is better than that of codlin and short's punch and judy and almost as good as that of mrs jarley's waxworks indeed the humour is similar for punch is supposed to be funny but napoleon as mrs jarley said when asked if her show was funnier than punch was not funny at all the idea of a really tragic scene being enacted between tiny wooden dolls with large heads is delightfully dealt with by dickens we can almost imagine the scene in which the wooden napoleon haughtily rebukes his wooden jailer for calling him general bonaparte sir hudson low call me not thus i am napoleon emperor of the french there is also something singularly gratifying about the scene of napoleon's death in which he lay in bed with his little wooden hands outside the counterpane and the doctor who was hung on wires too short delivered medical opinions in the air it may seem flippant to dwell on such flippancies in connection with a book which contains many romantic descriptions and many moral generalizations which dickens probably valued highly but it is not for such things that he is valued in all his writings from his most reasoned and sustained novel to his maddest private note it is always this obstreperous instinct for farce which stands out as his in the highest sense his wisdom is at the best talent his foolishness is genius just that exuberant levity which we associate with the moment we associate in his case with immortality it is said of certain old masonry that the mortar was so hard that it has survived the stones so if dickens could revisit the thing he built he would be surprised to see all the work he thought solid and responsible wasted almost utterly away but the shortest frivolities and the most momentous jokes remaining like colossal rocks forever the end of section fifteen chapter nine pictures from italy